gentlemen, welcome back to podcastjuice.net. This is the podcast about Prince on Prince. You know how we call it. We have special guests here today. But before we introduce him, uh, Big Sexy and Saxer, how are you? Oh, I'm not the special guest? <laughs> well, you know, you're the pre-special guest. How about that? Okay, cool. I'm the opening act. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing great. Had a long day in court yesterday, but at the end of the day, you know, it was a good day. You know, when you do good work, the clients are loyal, and sometimes they give you goodies, and hey, everybody's happy. It's all that matters. All right. I take it you were not representing Jesse Smollett this week. Uh, yeah, no. Okay. No. <laughs> 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 All right, ladies and gentlemen, we definitely have a special guest, and he has been on the show before, uh, a couple of years ago, but now he is back, and uh, Mr. Michael Bland, sir, how are you? Hey, I'm all right, man. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Doing Big Sexy, what's going on, man? Big Mike, man. My <laughs> ribs still hurt from your drum, you know, your drum kicks, man. <laughs> Hilarious. It's a good pain. It's a good pain. Man. Oh, it's a great pain. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, now, nah, man, I, can I call you Michael? Is that, I'm assuming. Yeah, that. absolutely. All right. All right. So, Michael, man, uh, thank you for coming back on. And hopefully you've been doing good. So it's been, let me start here. It has been, what, a couple years since the last time you're on the show. And the world has changed dramatically oh, <laughs> in the boy, last, who, last year, if not alone. Who would have thought? How, man, how, yeah, we, how has this affected, you know, you, you and your band, Soul Asylum, and... And being a musician. Well, you know, we actually um, toured from, what was it, like around August 11th or so until, what was it, like September 19th or 18th? We had a, we we went um, east from from Minnesota. We, we did the east, some of the Midwest, mm -hmm. and we made it across the country as far as probably... Um, I want to say maybe Texas Okay. before we started working our way back and doing like, um, you know, like Nebraska and places like that on the way back. Um, but we didn't get out to the West Coast and we didn't we did a few dates down south, but they were they were scattered um, being out there at a time when a lot of people were canceling their shows and going home or. You know, one or the other, like some people were out there and went home and other people were trying to get out and then just stopped trying. Mm. You know, we just kind of decided that we needed to get out there for ourselves and see what was really happening. And uh, it was a very interesting experience, man. It's, uh, it's a lot of people out there who really don't believe that this COVID thing is real. Uh, uh, <laughs> you, uh -oh. you know, <laughs> okay. uh, we had an altercation with a uh, with a front of house engineer who would, would have been assisting our front of house engineer in uh, somewhere in Illinois, maybe Aurora. And uh, the the guy, I guess he was hired in uh, um, because a lot of venues were just starting back up, and so they were short on uh, you know staff. So this guy was supposed to be working there for the night. Turns out he was an anti vaxxer kind of an you know kind of an anti the, all the way around. Didn't want to wear a mask, wasn't shot up. And we had a very uh, strict regimen we, we were under. Our tour manager, Janine Anderson, uh, was determined that we were going to come home without anybody being infected. And she accomplished her goal. And it's uh, wow. a lot of that has to do with her ingenuity and her um, uh, real sort of, you know, I guess, inner responsibility to, to to defend us you know okay and uh we couldn't always affect the overall dynamic of the club but we definitely had a lock on backstage and so after that it was just up to us to just stay away you know wow and it's funny man we were i mean some shows people were trying to jump on the stage and you know, trying to, <laughs> hey, can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah, from there, man, from there. <laughs> you know, how was like, the turnout to the shows? People, people coming out? Or? I actually, it, it was, um, it was pretty good. Uh, the the dynamic that we really faced was, mm, I feel like we were outsmarted a little bit in respect to the fact that people who would ordinarily be cautious 
still, you know, stayed home. They like if you if it was a concern to you, you weren't going all of a sudden just go well at Soul Asylum and come out. Right. You know, if you if you really felt the need to protect yourself, you probably didn't show up. Uh, but, you know, lo and behold, the the, the scores of people who <laughs> don't care or think it's a hoax or whatever, they, they came out in droves. <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, where does that put you? You know, you're you know, you're doing shows for people who are being, you know, inconsiderate, you know, people who are centrist, you know, or centered on themselves. And uh you know, I remember feeling at some point, I'm like, are, are we awarding these people who are actually mm. keeping this thing going? Mm. You know, so I, you know, that was the ethical question for me. It's like, what are we promoting here? What was the answer to that? <laughs> I, I don't, I still don't really have it. I had a lot of like post-traumatic stress about it, you know, because it's, it, you're out there, you know, when once you get on the road, once you get on the bus... It's you are subject to whatever you know transpires after that. Wherever the bus goes is where you're going, you know. So yeah. since I didn't have a whole lot of choice at that point, uh, yeah, I think that I just kind of stored all of this sort of trauma in some space in my brain to unhatch later on because it wasn't going to do me any good to try to examine these things while I'm trying to do my job. Right, right. So, man, that's kind of a hard question. To sort of ponder for yourself, like like the, the responsibility of like one, I have to earn a living, right? I'm responsible for myself, but then at the same point, I'm going out, and am I contributing? Like you said, you know, am I sort of furthering this issue with bringing all these people out to come and see us, and then I'm taking money for? I mean, that's I wouldn't have thought to ask you something like that, but that's actually pretty interesting. That's okay. It's I mean, it's a I'm I'm you know I mean I don't know that I would take the risk again, but I'm glad I got we got out there to see for ourselves what was really happening because you can't trust the news. Mm, okay, okay. We might jump back. Uh, can you? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends on what news you're talking about, what it's about. Everyone has some agenda, I suppose. I, th- yeah, I'm. I'm not even pointing anybody in particular out. I just think that the news is gotcha. the the news is not what it used to be in this country. They used to just report the facts right. and let you decide for yourself. Like like Reuters over in Europe, like they don't really say nothing. They just show you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny and I were in Italy actually during the G8 summit, mm. and it was there that year. And we were up late night because that's just what we do. We sit up and you know. Just, you know, you know, the BS about whatever, you know, Sonny and I just we've been all over the world sitting in hotel lobbies till four o'clock in the morning watching CNN and whatnot. But in this particular case, we had Reuters on and they didn't they didn't say anything. They just showed footage for an hour of protesters being beat down by the police. Wow. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it was man, it was horrific. I, I've rarely seen anything that brutal i mean uh, unless you're talking about like <laughs> obviously like uh the george floyd murder mm-hmm. or you know ahmad arbery philando castile like mm-hmm. all of those like i don't even know what to say about the, the watching black men being you know killed in the street like i i i, I think i've personally decided i'm not going to watch anymore trauma Porn yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that's not it's not natural. You're not supposed to be watching that type of thing. And you definitely not supposed to think it's not going to change you somewhat on the inside. You're talking about basic humanity at this right. point. And so let me, let's talk about that. Like and you are out there. You live in Minnesota, right? You, you live, I certainly do. Sort of the, right uh, yeah. there where it's mm-hmm. going down. What is what is it going to say about? The generation of today, or those that are coming up, that are sort of growing up, seeing these videos on a, just a constant basis, where it's it's not even a shock anymore. It's almost the expectation there's going to be a new video of some black person dying or something. How do you, how do you think that's going to affect the psyche? Like when they become our our age and they grew up seeing, you know, people that look like their dad or themselves. Um, wow, man, I, I don't know if I know how to answer that question. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm old enough to remember 
Rodney King, seeing right. that, right. you know, and a, a lot of people that, a lot of younger people that I know, they 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 don't know so much about that. But um, that was like the one. That was such an isolated thing to see it. Actually, yeah, it was you know, not an isolated e e event, incident, right? Right. And and neither is it now. These are not the only black people getting murdered. These are just the ones that they, they happen to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that if it wasn't for the 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 cell phone and you know the 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 camera app. <laughs> We we'd still be in the dark. We'd still be right. trying to convince white people that there are two Americas. Now, now that we are seeing the the constant footage, though, right? That, that's what I wonder. Like, because back then, Rodney King, or it was rare to see that. We all knew these things existed, mm -hmm. but it was sort of the convincing thing. Now that the world is sort of convinced, uh, you can't ignore it, I suppose, because it, it's in front of their face. Well, here's the thing. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, I better say this while it's on my mind. The actually, I'm a lot less concerned about what it does to black people, young black people, than what it does to white people. Mm. To me, the fact that this is allowed to happen—that they'll just play this stuff on the news or, you know, in perpetuity on YouTube—is that. I'm more worried about the fact that it says to this country that black lives are expendable. It would, I mean, to white people, not to black people. We already know what <laughs> how they feel about us. But the fact that they do keep this visible and in front of the world's face, I think that it's that uh, it's one way in order. To, uh, it's one way for them to de sensitize mm -hmm. people to this event that happens happens all the time. That's what I really don't like about it is that it's people will start to, to norm. They're normalizing it on purpose. I feel. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Cause like, cause we're kind of like in the period of, wow, I have to acknowledge that this stuff happens. These videos are horrific. I wouldn't be a human being if I didn't acknowledge it. In my opinion, Mm -hmm. uh, hence the you know pushing of the Black Lives Matter movement and right. sort of white people standing on the front like I'm an ally. I, I feel like yeah they would have to do that because you don't want to be seen as an uh, inhumane person. Now I'm not saying that there are people that truly feel that way they do, but I just feel like the way it's been brought to the forefront. But I wonder kind of what you're saying is after they get past that part and I'm done feeling guilty about it. Yeah, it's just a normal thing. Yeah. Then what? Well, yeah, then, right. then they're going to start saying, well, what are you going to do? Mm. And that's a, an even more interesting question. What are they going to do? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is, you know, I mean, I didn't expect to go down this road with you, Michael Dean, but I will. That's cool. um, for instance, uh, once the Asian Lives Matter hey, movement good. came up, the Stop Asian Hate and all that. Right. Now they dealt with that pretty quick. They got they got the bill passed. Everything's all good. You haven't heard anything else about it since. The George Floyd bill, just dead in the water. Nobody's doing nothing. Um they brought us here. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe not necessarily before everybody else, but in in, in greater numbers. Um, I, I'm trying not to lose my train of thought. No, you're good. There's more of us here, you know, to start with, but justice for us always comes last. No lies, no lies told. <laughs> I, I don't understand that. Like, what are if they can take care of the 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 Asian hate bill can can be pushed through and they can you know, uh. Get a little, you know, shot in the arm, a little, little boost, you know, get a little more legislative uh, significance. That's that's great for them. But when is it coming for us? When 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 will white people be able to acknowledge the past and try to do something about it for the future? Well, one of the things they would tell you is that, you know, somebody could say, well, it's not my fault, Michael. I didn't hold you. I'm not holding you back. I didn't bring you here in chains. Yeah. Well, can't, can't you guys just pull yourself up by the bootstraps?
strap. Right. You got to have boots to do that. <laughs> right. You first you need the boots. And that's the that's the other part. It's like they want to pretend that they don't know. I'm I know I understand why I'm why I'm kind of hot. Why why I, I you know the cayenne pepper is coming up in my bloodstream. <laughs> I watched that Colin in black and white uh, okay. uh, limited series on Netflix. I haven't seen that. How was it? Oh man, I thought it was incredible. Okay. Ava DuVernay, I've posted on on Facebook. That she's a genius. Mm. I mean. The way they mix the media, and um, it's a combination of like a history lesson, a lecture on you know the sociology in America. It's kind of like an autobiography. It's kind of educational. It's like it covers a lot of ground because it's Kaepernick. You know, you see his life story, but it's in relation to you know the backdrop of what America is and has been. You know, wow. and why um, they want to make such a big deal about him taking a knee, mm. and and also why they can't face the real issue at hand, because they can't center and focus on the fact that there's something to protest to begin with. Like they, white people know how bad it is for black people in America. They know. They know this, but in, instead of running a proper dialogue about it, they want to use a diversion. Mm. You know, like they don't know what he's got his knee on on the soil for. They know why, but to to admit that that problem exists is to have to re, you know, reimagine you, you, your self image, how you see yourself. Uh, what does I was watching something else recently? What does whiteness do to, you know, the psychology of white people? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like having this, having this, these psychological stigmatisms that they have to uphold to cover the lie. Mm. Like, what does that do to, to to white people? We know what it does to black folks, but. I mean the the conscience the conscience of white America is what needs healing, and you can't heal until you acknowledge what's actually going on. Right. I wonder if it's it. I just don't. I think it's harder for some white people to to see it that way because it's mm -hmm. because it's dealing with uh, like black people or just people that are not them in their whole life. You just weren't taught to not think like that. And I think if you can present it to them in a, and I've always said this, if you can present it to them maybe in some science science fiction or something, <laughs> then they can maybe see because then they would they would um, out the gate oppose that type of oppression. <laughs> but, sure. but when they don't see them being their oppressor, like when I look at Star Wars or something, I was like, now I can look at Star Wars and be like, you know, this kind of talking about the government. <laughs> And these, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they can cheer for it in that capacity, but I just don't think they visualize themselves as being the empire. Like, I always feel like sometimes the United States is actually more closer to the empire, Darth Vader and those guys, than we would be the, you know, the rebels or something like that. Like, but I live here. <laughs> yeah. And I have to acknowledge that, well, I actually live in the empire. And, and I can rationalize it to some degree, I guess. And some way, a white person may be able to rationalize the way this system is for themselves. Like, well, yeah, it's fucked up, but. Well, that's bigger than me. I can't really do much, and I'm benefiting yeah. from it. I'm not going to put it in your face that I'm benefiting from it, but it is what it is. Sure, and I think that's that's that that's there's probably probably more of those white people in this country than any. I don't mean to insinuate that they're all upset or that they're all hiding their heads in the sand, but there's definitely agenda afoot. You know, I mean, I, I don't I don't know that they could even dispute that, that 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 this is just the way things have been built. I remember a friend of mine asking me, like, you really think that white people were so clever that they could invent such a system that could hold everybody else down while they flourish? And I had to remind this dude that benevolence and intelligence don't necessarily go hand in hand. Hmm. Like, there's all sorts of evil geniuses in the world, you know, 
And sanctions, well, not sanctions, but studies can be, you know, uh, studies can be sanctioned, you know, to illuminate or or distract from, you know, what some people might call the truth. You know, it's a it's a it's it's an ongoing thing. And uh, I'm of a mind that a lot of stuff just could, could be burnt down right now. Um, and a lot of people disagree with that. But when I think about the fact that black people are considered, well, first of all, black people are not even considered in the original constitution. Mm. It, it, there's an amendment <laughs> that gave us three fifths, you know, and you're talking about, you know, the document with which a lot of people who intend to do nothing but evil stand upon. Mm. Like until you, you, it, it, I, I, you can build on, you can have a hoopty, you can put some nice rims on it. You can, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. You can, right. you know, you can, you can concern yourself about the optics, but that doesn't change, you know, the, the disrepair. Mm. I already see. I already see the look on some of the listeners' face already. <laughs> All right, well, I didn't sign a, up for this. Well, hey, this is what we talk about. white audience. <laughs> well, well, I mean, we, we have a pretty fair audience. It's, it's, it goes fifty. All right, because you know some some you know. But some there's some story. black people that's going to be feeling the same way. I, I don't uh, like yeah, that. Yeah, how about that? Actually, you know, it's I'm learning. I'm I'm what? Fifth, I'll be fifty three in March. I'm learning, uh, Dean, that. Uh, black people are not a monolith. Right. That there's a, a lot of like young black conservative. Uh, a lot of old ones too. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I you know I don't I don't uh, I don't get around my people as much as I'd like to because mm. it's Minnesota and there ain't that many. Hilarious. But um, yeah. Okay. You know <laughs> some of those people think Candace Owens is on to something. Hilarious. Oh, well, no, that's so funny. <laughs> I, I can see what the type of stuff you you watch. Do you watch YouTube? Are you a YouTube watcher? I I I, I like to uh, go to YouTube and I like to 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 watch a lot of lectures on okay, you know, social issues. Got it, got it. Oh, and we didn't mention this. It's we really just kind of going. You since the last time you were on the show, you started a podcast, right? You, I, I be seeing you, you guys doing what? live streams and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it, well, we we used to do it a bit more often, uh, but I I really got burnt out and uh, and kind of um, uh, I don't want to say depressed, but it's it's hard to talk about issues that. With 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 no 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 solvency in sight, with no closure, mm, okay. it's hard to do that. You know, on a weekly basis, or a, uh, yeah, I guess we were going every week. That's a job. Yeah, it's a it's job. It, it. I mean, but what it was doing to my to my spirit or to my mind, mm. you know, I was just like, I I can't keep doing this. I mean, you. I, I think the whoever was killed first after after George Floyd. Whoever the, the like the next murder was which got that's the one got you. Well, that's the one it was like, okay, well, nothing learned and less news coverage. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, it just uh it kind of put things in a place for me where it's like, okay, uh, this is this is a perhaps a generational thing, like some people like to say that you know, the hateful people in this world will die out and leave this place, you know, <laughs> a thriving utopia. I don't know if that's true either. Hey, I don't know about that. No, so, I definitely, I, I yeah. I, it's a, uh, a lot of young cats with them tiki churches. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And they don't want to be replaced. Did you hear them say that? Uh, no, I didn't. They, oh, they say it all the time. They don't want to be replaced, Michael Dean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Here's the thing, the, the thing that's on my mind now about all this. It's like, how can you complain about, uh, well, I don't know how deep I want to go, man. That's all good. <laughs> however you want to do just, it. Well, I, I just, it's, it's funny how 
some white people, let's start saying some, some white people, uh, well, nah, let me backpedal. <laughs> they think about it. I see. Yeah, well, it's turning like, in his mind. Nah, I don't know if I want to smoke on if I'm gonna, Well, if I'm going to blow it up, I got to have the right words to, to, to well, do Well, then, if you got hesitation, I say pump. Let's pump brakes. Yeah. I, 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 you know, we don't need to. It's, it's Saturday morning. We got yeah, yeah, exactly. Had your pancakes and <laughs> your, your rice checks and your. A rice checks. Hilarious. <laughs> I have my egg with waffles. That's what I have. Well, all right. Yeah. Breakfast of champions. Then yeah. why not? Yeah, no. a little shit. You know. Let's 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 back up. Yeah, I didn't. We, we, okay. But yeah, you know what? I love, I love that. This is but this is what we be thinking about. This is, this is now. I know Big Sexy over there, quiet as a mouse. I'm gonna let him live because he got him. a lot to say, but he don't want to say it either. <laughs> He don't want to. He don't want to rock the boat. Well, he's a he's a litigator. So there you go. He only speaks he's, fire. So he well, uh, yeah. I was saying it, when he speaks, it's it's in order to yeah. He's he's going uh, verbally burn some things down. <laughs> um, did you want to say something, Big Sexy, or I'll, I'll move on or keep moving? No, no, no. Just keep moving. Okay, I'm just that, sitting there right. taking it all in. Yes, sir. Well, all Mike. Right, well, oh, what, well, I'm curious to know what Big Sexy has to say about <laughs> what I just was saying. <laughs> Well, you said a lot of different things. One thing that stood out the most to me <clears throat> was going back to the media and the media representations, especially of black people. I have seen this for years, and I'm a couple of years older than you, Mike, <clears throat> so I've seen this for years, and I've seen stand-up comics make jokes about it. I've seen it happen, you know, in my presence. Now, before I go into my little, you know, spiel... Uh, I don't know who remember, remember who said this, but no one has gone broke on selling fear of black people to white people. Well, that's just the way it is. Uh -huh. And in the media here, I, I don't know about writers. You know, they sound pretty you know balanced, but the media here, especially local media, their job is to scare white people. Period. Because every time, and I pay attention to this. Every time you see a black person mentioned in a, in a criminal setting, oh, well, this guy was scary and dangerous, and they show the mug shot, the whole nine. And if there's people at a at an event or a news gathering event, <clears throat> and they see two black guys, and I'm okay, I'll, fuck it, I'll say me. This has happened to me. Will they talk <laughs> to me when I come out of court? Of course, they're not going to talk to me. They're going to talk to Ray Ray with the sagging pants and shower cap on his head. And that happens constantly. And when you get bombarded with this imagery, all you think is, well, fuck, I don't see any lawyers out there. I don't see any doctors. I see Ray Ray all the damn time. And that just starts to wear and grate on you. Just carrying all that weight is just a pain in the ass sometimes. And when you brought that up, that's what, that's Im immediately where I went to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All it's right. a lot being the standard bearer. I feel it every time I walk into a place where there's, I'm the only person of color there. Mm. I, I know that everything that I do is going to be, is going to go back to my people. They're going to use their interaction with me to determine their interaction with black people en masse. Mm. Mm. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of responsibility to carry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the news would rather have you think that we all Ray Ray. I, I agree. Keep them afraid, and then then you know move on with the with the agenda. And wow. see, for me, and this is just I'm speaking solely for myself now. I I feel, and I could be wrong here. I feel it. You know, it's doubled because I'm a huge man. So. Well, if look, I we had can a talk nickel. to you, big sexy. <laughs> <laughs> we can, well, you you speak in my, definitely my language. Now, go ahead, man. I didn't mean to touch you. Say what, you, say what you meant to say, but I got you. Now, I, I know you work me on this one, Mike. You know, I'll walk into the courtroom in like a new location, and I got my working clothes on the whole nine, and there are other black lawyers in there, but there's no one in the room who looks like me. And so I'm getting it twice. I'm getting, oh, there's the black guy. Oh, shit, there's the enormous guy. You know, uh -huh. and people who don't know me run up on me, hate to see you in a dark alley. I'm like, what the fuck does that even mean, man? Because I'm big, that means I'm violent? What the? Right. Ah, drives me crazy. Yeah. 
Absolutely, man. That's why I, I, I stopped going. I think one of the last concerts I went to strictly for my enjoyment was uh, probably in the 90s, and it was uh, The Time at first half. Wow. It was like right when The Time like came right back. They, they came out, came back out. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, since then, if I can't get a... Um, you know, say, like, Mike, uh, VIP. Go ahead, say it. Yeah. If I can't get rock star parking and then, you know, like hang out like at the monitor board, if I can't be on stage near the performers, I don't go. I, Dude, I don't you, go. You said everything I experience, and I, I don't go to shows for the same reason. If my clients are doing a show, I'm either on stage in the wings mm-hmm. or, you know, behind the drum kit. I am not yeah. out there with the with the, the regular people because I don't, I don't need the fucking headache. Right. It's a it's a lot. It's a lot to go through. Um, Saying because of people will react a certain way to you because of your size. Oh God, yes, man. Interesting. Constantly. Oh yeah. A little bit. There's I've been in restaurants. That. I've been in restaurants. And I've been in bars. And I'm not a big drinker, Mike. You know this. But I, I'll be in a city like that, and more often than I, you know, could actually care to admit, someone has walked up to me and says, "Hey, big guy, what are you drinking?" I'm like, "Do I know you, man?" Well, you know, if it goes down, I want to know that you're on my side. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> you don't take that as a, that's not a comp. That's, to me, that I guess that would, they, they kind of like cat calling you. Is that what you say? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it's, that's funny, man. Because you just, you conjured a memory for me, man. I remember. See? Um, See? <laughs> I was um, somewhere with, with Prince and somebody kind of tried to walk up on him and I stepped in front. Like, uh, I think either uh, Gilbert or Dwayne was like, you know, there as head of security, but they like they went to the bar to, to, to get something or they went to the, the limo to get something. And so I just kind of stepped forward like, hey, man, keep it moving. Uh uh-uh. <laughs> And Prince was like, well, you ever you ever thought about doing security? Oh. <laughs> and that was the only that. Listen, now, I, I know from speaking to other people that Prince understood who I was as, as as a person in terms of like uh uh critical thinking skills so on and so forth like he didn't he was not a person who uh he, prince had some idea of how how smart i i, I am or i think i am okay. <laughs> so it was not he was not objectifying me i i think that he really felt safe in my presence at that moment Interesting. um but that's the only instance I would say that I, I took that, you know, in, in the in the spirit it was given. Any other time, it's always like, well, what are you insinuating? That I don't have anything in, in my head? All mm-hmm. I'm good for is is, is being a wall? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I think I've, and in a way, I've spent my life fighting that, that stigma. And that's kind of what drove me to, you know, to excel. Okay. That I needed to prove to people that I wasn't just, you know. Right, right. The big guy. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. A blunt object. <laughs> oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, See, Mike, you and I are here, man. You and I yeah, are here. We're here. <laughs> we oh, yeah. got to get him here. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> get your boy. I'm not a big guy like that, but well, I, I am know, big, you know what I'm saying? I, but that's I a different club. That, yeah. Y'all might not be a part of that big club. Oh, yeah. oh <laughs> here you go. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> here you go. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so you know, it's, it's, that was the only time, you know. But like in high school, I was in, you know, I was in, you know, in band, and the football coach kept trying to get me on the field. Wow. You know, I'm like that ain't me, man. I I don't even like football. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, so okay. it's you know, it's just it's it comes with with the territory to a certain degree, and also you know, uh, it's something I've pondered often that you know Prince had the opposite problem. If pre- people yeah. were to judge you by yeah. by their size, mm-hmm. uh, by your size, you know, it's like they he was overlooked, diminutive, you know, for 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 many of his formative years. So, you know, I feel like we almost had that sort of there was something, there was a synergy between us because the conditions are somewhat similar, just on opposite ends of the yeah, yeah, yeah agree, yeah, kind of sorta like really, you know, uh-huh. it's like I I first off. Um, at least in the band, it's like you got to be, you know, you got to be pretty smart to work that close with Prince. Anyway, mm-hmm. you almost gotta gotta see what's coming before he even says it. Mm. You know, so even even if 
maybe not necessarily smart, but aware. Like you got to kind of be looking and assessing, you know. So, you know, I, I don't think I mean, n nobody, nobody I worked with with Prince was was any kind of dummy. Like you, what can you do with a, with a, with a stupid person? Nothing, you know. Yeah, I would be fair to say all of you guys, from my perspective as a fan, seem overly exceptional <laughs> in what you did, like the top of the top to be. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it, but it just it, it's par for the course. You just right. it's it, it you takes a genius to understand a genius almost, you know, Yeah, it's like he didn't yeah. want to have to, you know, like spoon feed. You know, that was a waste of his time. He the more time he spent trying to be understood, the less time he could spend on his visualization and actualization. So you really need people. It's like, well, okay, got it. Minimal info. I mean, a lot of that. Uh, that is the reason why I think Sonny and I got called so often. You know, in like during the aughts. You know, um, like for Planet Earth and mm -hmm. Lotus Flower and. Uh, uh, 3121 there was a, a type of shorthand sort of way that uh we developed together like to just keep things moving prince just loved to feel productive and that things were coming together and so sunny and i is like we we're almost you know two halves of the same brain so and i think that sunny's relationship with prince from like back in the day like it's we could just could get things done real fast, mm. you know. It's it's uh, and that 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 meant he could be more productive even on his own. You know, after we leave, it's like okay, well, the table's set. Let's eat, <laughs> you know. Like that. So like, that's what yeah. I. That's kind of what I call when you meet certain people. It's like it's that sort of thing where you already know, like. Yeah, you come up. Exactly. Oh man, I feel uh, you already know, Playboy. Let's do this. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to explain a lot of stuff. And I, and we may have talked about this in the last one, but I don't remember. Like when you guys were like, it would be a rehearsal or you're in the studio, whatever it is. You guys are are you already set up? Your drums set up already, Sonny and whoever the other band members ready to go, and the Prince just come in and start sort of saying, "Hey, this is what we're gonna do," or is he already there and you guys come in? You know how does how did it normally work if it was a normal? Procedure? He almost always came in uh, after. Okay. I mean, the thing was that even while we were sleeping, he was working on something. So there were many times we'd be ready to rehearse, and Levi would walk in and say, uh, "Prince ain't gonna be with us today," and we, you know, let's get it. The sooner we finish, the sooner we can leave, and we crank it up. And Prince would come walking in maybe 30, 45 minutes into the show, you know, or, and as he's walking, top of the show, <laughs> he's walking to the stage, top of the show, and the, the lights get, re, you know, fixed back to, you know, first position. Everybody takes their place on stage, you know. Um, but uh, sometimes he just walk in and he start playing something we hadn't heard before, and he start giving instructions. You know, a lot of, a lot of music happened like that. Wow. Uh, let me throw in two more things, and then I'll drop it. Uh, Mike, you were saying that <clears throat> you know you didn't you didn't like football, and you were a band guy, which is cool. Um, on that similar vein, you know, you don't want to be looked at as a wall. I'll be backstage at my one of my one of my clients is a concert promoter, and so I'll be at you know various shows, and people run up on me. Oh man, you know you're the security. No. Oh, well, you're one of the roadies. No. <laughs> who, who who are you? I'm the promoter's attorney. What can I do for you? Oh shit. Oh wow. Well, yeah. yeah. Now, get out uh -huh. of here, man. From real business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, tying this back to Prince and Michael Dean knows this. Back during the Third Eye Girl shows, you know, they landed at DNA Lounge in San Francisco, and I was there. And outside, the people are lining up. And security comes out and says, you know, you can't line up yet, blah, blah, blah. And they just, it was just a weird coincidence that I was dressed in a black t-shirt like they were. <laughs> and so people are coming to me and security comes back and they're like, yeah, okay, line up behind him. And they point at me like I'm one of them. I'm like, behind who? Oh, me? 
I'm like, yeah, yeah, line up behind me, hurry it up. Exactly. <laughs> see, see, now you played into it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if they're gonna, if they're gonna, if they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna do it like that anyway. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, wow. So, okay. I mean, I man, I. I don't think I had to show my laminate to anybody the entire tour. They know when I show up, I see? come come limping through that door. You know, nobody asks nothing. I'm I'm in my black bibs. I'm in my black shirt, and uh, nobody even asked me the question. Uh, excuse me, sir. Can we? Yeah, that's the only instance in which nobody asked me nothing. Huh. So, because once they know. know, they know. Yeah, sure. Like well, he he's if, if I mean I would argue that anybody if you act like you you where you're supposed to be, oh, yeah. ain't really gonna be no trouble. No, but I agree. I agree. It, Have I'm some just, game about yourself. That's what we say. Yeah, just yeah, it just exactly. Be cool. Uh, you know, don't start nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's not true either. I guess. <laughs> That's the yeah. wrong door. Uh, uh, anyway, wrong? That's, yeah, that's that's sure. Let me get off that. <laughs> um, let's change it up a little bit. Uh, let's have some. Hopefully, this will be fun. So, I was just before we were watching doing this. I was watching the Jank, Drink Champs podcast. Shout out to them, and they had Alicia Keys on there. It's very interesting. Uh oh. <laughs> but they do a thing on that show where they ask questions of the guests, and they'll do an either or question. Now, on their show, you got to take a drink. If you don't want to answer, we don't have to know tanking drinks here. But I just thought in the spirit of it maybe being fun, we'll ask you some questions, Michael. And, and you got to just give us, you have to, you, well, we're asking to make a choice here, but you could choose not to as well. Okay. So, you ready for the first one? I am. All right. Uh, Sheila E or Bobby Z? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know what? Um, I think that Bobby was a good drummer. I think that once the Lynn machine, the electronic stuff came in, I think he, he um, you know, the challenge wasn't there anymore. Mm. Um, I think that um, Bobby was more faithful to what happened on the records, um, even before the, the Lynn machine and all that. But, you know, Sheila, Sheila's a master. Yeah. See, Michael Dean, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, once again, Michael Bland and I, he and I are here, okay? Because <laughs> someone asked me that very question the other day. I'm like, look, Bobby got caught up under the Len drum and the Simmons drum and all that stuff. Yeah. Where, where Sheila's just doing her thing. So that's why people look at Bobby as somewhat being, you know, lesser than that. And that's not fair. So, yeah, I mean, I fair. understand exactly right. what Michael Bland is saying. Mm -hmm. Because he and I are here, Michael. He and I are here. I'm sorry. Who who was the pick? I, I, I heard. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, if I had to choose, um, I, well, wow, man. See, <laughs> it, it's, you don't it, have. Well, if you don't want to, you don't. I, mean, I'm not I, I don't. I, you know, I I just think that um, uh, I, I'm a I'm the type of dude I like to hear. Like I kind of like to hear the record when I go to the show. Okay. I don't. Uh, so that's you know <laughs> any any extrapolation. I, I I'm like oh okay we're into some different territory here. And even when I when I play with Soul Asylum, it's like I I'm faithful to what what the other drummers have played on those records. I start there at least, mm. and then I figure out how to how to put my own spin on it. You know after a few after I've. Uh, been playing a piece of music for a little while. Um, but it's like, you can't take anything away from Sheila. I'm just saying, don't take anything away from Bobby because he was a victim of circumstance. Boom. So are you just going to, are you giving us the PC? Just say PC if you don't want to pick. <laughs> well, uh, you know. You're a defensive attorney from both sides. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I could, I could really make a, Make make a choice, choice. Okay, you know they both have 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 different glaring attributes, you know, or had. Absolutely, I, I, okay. I, it's kind of it's kind of apples and oranges, man. All right, oh, we'll take that. So for the listeners, you have to take the drink, since if he doesn't make a real choice, <laughs> <yet>. <laughs> <laughs> we 
So you've got the you've got the listeners taking a drink right there. Yeah, I'm not oh. even really trying to be PC. I'm just, I mean, I'm not <laughs> looking to offend anybody either. But I'm just saying, it, it's a different animal. It's like with Sheila, it's like you can't take your eyes off what she's doing. Yeah. With Bobby, it's like you feel him. He's not, he, you know, he's not flashy, but but you know, he was laying laying it down, man. Got it, got it. All right, next one up is. Miko Weaver, or Wendy. Oh man, come on, brother. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I had more experience. I, I never got to play with Wendy, so I don't really know uh, the depth uh, of you know of her bag of, bag of bag of tricks or bag of goodies. Mm. Miko Weaver, man. Uh, may be the tightest rhythm guitar player I ever mm. got to play with. Um, just effortless. Like, whatever that is he's got is just... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's some, like, Oakland, like, it's specific where, where Miko comes from, you know? And him, Whit Prince, and Levi, like, that the, the new tour band... Man, I mean, it's like I didn't even have to count. Like, playing with Miko, it's like you don't even have to think about it. Like, he did for me what I do for a lot of other people, where it's like they say, well, yeah, I love playing with you, man, because it's like they, you don't have to guess where the time is at. You know, it's straight down the pipe. Like, you make me a tighter player. That's what I felt like Miko did for me. So I'm, I'm biased because that was my experience, you know? Okay. okay. Good choice. Good choice. Uh, <laughs> this might be a... Hard one. I don't know. Eighties, oh, eighties well, Prince or nineties Prince? Me, eighties. Wow. Yeah. You said that with no hesitation. Well, only. Well, you have to take into account also the fact that I'm I'm real. Uh, I'm kind of a perfectionist about like my playing. Like when I listen to the nineties music, the nineties Prince music that I was on. It's it's hard for me to be objective because I was there. I have all sorts of tactile, you know, residue going through my system. <laughs> I remember where we were at. I remember what happened that day. Mm. You know, so it's distracting for me. It's not necessarily a qualitative uh, choice, but I, I can't listen to that music and judge it for its own merit or by its own merit. Okay. Is it just um, hard to disassociate yourself from it? Yeah, I can't. So it's like when I want to, if I really feel like listening to Prince, it's almost every time it's like controversy or like so, like pre-Purple Rain. And then uh, I'll dabble with, with the records after. But um, actually- Why do you say uh, that? That's interesting. <laughs> uh, just because I feel like uh, in certain cases, he, he let his- um, I think I think the 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 change in business changed him to a certain degree artistically. How so? I, I I just feel like he was a lot more free before Purple Rain, and he spent the remainder of yeah. the eighties in a quandary artistically. Mm. I, I mean, I, I man, I love uh, Under the Cherry Moon, like the soundtrack to Parade. Or the or the parade the soundtrack to under the cherry moon rather, <laughs> I love that record. That record was um, early on for me like a big. Um, give me one second. Oh, sorry, excuse Bless me. You. Bless you. Thank you. Um, that record really made me a fan. Um, I was somewhat familiar with his work before that, but um. You know, I know we've talked about this before. It's like there's a lot of not mixed messages going on in Prince's music, but a lot of a lot of buttons getting pushed. You know, mm -hmm. and I don't know if I I like that so much. Um, but Parade felt to me like um like an honest uh giving artistically, and maybe it was just because I mean it was centered around a movie, so. The inspiration was more direct, and like he didn't. Have, it's not. It's it's just not. It's not as much of a. I feel like he did that record 
to please himself, sort of. Okay, I get what you're saying now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like Around the World in the Day was too close to Purple Rain to be judged by itself, you know, and, you know, uh, uh, I thought it was um, uh, very uncool of Warner Brothers to go and say, well, you only sold five and a half million copies of this record, so it's kind of a flop. After this Purple Rain sold like 18 million. Like, are, are you, any other artist selling five million records? Even then. it's uh, And for them to just kind of, yeah, well, you know, just kind of shrug it off. Like, yeah, you should go back to the drawing board. Hmm. Um, I, yeah, I always felt felt some kind of way about that. I think Around the World in the Day is a great record also. Um, but that competition, you know, when he was literally competing against himself at that point. And, um, and I think he felt that way from that point forward, to be honest. That I think he's, he actually is probably a quote saying, the, the, my only living competition is me. Okay, so you went through, went with the eighties. All right, uh, for me, eighties. I mean, I you know sometimes I'll I'll giggle if, if Cream comes on and I'm somewhere I'm you know having dinner <laughs> somewhere or get off or if I'm watching the Timberwolves, you know, unfortunately lose, you know, <laughs> and one of the cuts I was on, you know, it starts getting played. I'm like, yeah, yeah, all right, all right, but to actually sit down and listen for enjoyment, that's almost impossible for me. Mm. Let me ask you about. Diamonds and pearls, cream. Some of those songs. When you hear, when you hear those songs, and you hear yourself play them, do you hear, like, are you like critical of yourself when you listen to them? Like, oh, I, I could have done that part better, or, or are those perfect records? I don't, I don't know if that's a word to say, but um, sometimes, sometimes one, sometimes the other. Like, I'll, I'll listen to something like, um, well. I think Cream is perfect. <laughs> and I also think the uh, the understated star of Cream is Sonny. Sonny Thompson is playing some stuff on the bass that's so subtle that it's getting past most people. Sonny was just in a different headspace that day, and he was killing it. It's in little ways, but it was something happening with him and the rest of us that day that that track has magic on it to me. It's pretty much almost everything that you hear, we were recording together. That that rhythm section recorded a lot of music together. Like okay. me, Levi, Tommy, Prince, Sonny, Kirk on percussion. Like hmm. that unit, almost everything that was recorded in that era that involved us, we were all together. Same room, looking at each other. You know, I think that's a that's a feeling that you can't uh, you can't uh, reproduce or, you know, like artificially like you got to be close. Somebody asked me recently, actually, about like how do you feel about like, you know, transatlantic recording and like, you know, mm -hmm. fiber optics and like they're getting to the point where you can record with other people mm -hmm. in different places at the same time. Yeah. And uh, they said, well, do you think that will replace? I said, no, uh, uh. I don't think it ever will, because when people are in a room and they're responding to each other, that's an aspect that you can't, there's no substitute for that. There's no ones and zeros to, to compensate for two people being in the same room sharing ideas or, you know, or because everything's influencing your decisions, mm -hmm. like what you see, what you hear, what somebody might have said to you, right. you know. Uh, body language, all of that, you know. Wow, this is uh, you're bringing up something that's very interesting because I think if you just go back and listen to music over the last 15 years, maybe even longer, you can hear the difference in the music just off of what you just said. Like, you know what I mean? So, you have the era of the people playing together in the studio, particularly like when you listen to the 70s soul and and all that versus where you get to the era where not only becomes more producer driven, but it's a beat thing. Like, Hey, I made the beat and I'm just sending you the track, lay your vocal down. You're in some isolated place. You're not getting the same vibe that I had when I was making the beat. You know what I mean? And so uh -huh. much you can hear, hear the lack of the soul or 
the rhythm or something in the music today, I think because of circumstances like what you just described. Um, yeah, something something is 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 missing on a certain level. I mean, some people still cut like that. In in Nashville, they do it all the time. It just ain't it usually ain't nothing you or me or Big Sexy wants to hear. But <laughs> right. The, but but, the, but there's the, an honesty in that music the, though. Yes, that's yeah, well. Yeah, that's because he, you can because you can fake it if you're home by yourself. But if you actually you know yeah, yeah. sitting at your instrument, you know amongst your peers, you better bring it. I wonder. This is going to be interesting. I hope I'm alive when the whole meta VR thing is popping. And I'd be curious to see what the musicians of that era where they'll be able. I'm just thinking they put on headsets in individual places but they but they are their brain is convinced that they are in the same place and they are able to play and have that connection musically but they're halfway across the world i'd be very curious to hear the music of that era in those circumstances like ah well it's i mean you're gonna get a chance <laughs> maybe if you if you live long enough you keep right right keep uh eating those egos <laughs> you know, everybody get those uh, those uh, wheat biscuits that you would eat. Right? So. <laughs> yeah, these, these 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 crackers I got over here, get them and, triscuits, yeah. Yeah, triscuits, and, yeah, whole wheat, <laughs> rye crisp. <laughs> ah. <laughs> All right, uh, but yeah, I, yeah, I, okay. I, yeah, I don't, I, yeah, just to say, yeah, I don't, I to me, I think that that makes a difference, and I know that. Um, there's a. I was telling somebody that there's a lot of, you know, people like to ask, like, well, what's in the vault? You know, just random people sometimes. And, like, often there are other versions of songs that you already know. Prince, I, I, I think, often would conduct experiments. He'd try to best himself or try songs in a different kind of way. Like, the, the vault is full of, like, other versions of other songs. And um, I think that... Um, he would try songs sometimes on his own, and then he'd try a version with the band, you know, and okay. then he'd probably examine the two and, you know, make a choice from there. Um, but, you know, I, I know that Prince was, I mean, there's two versions of like, uh, take a song like 319. There's there's a full band version of 319. Really? Yeah. It just, he didn't like it. <laughs> wow. okay. So he, you know, he, he retooled it. And uh, yeah, there's a there's a full band version of Race. Uh, Whoa, yeah, there's that, that, that. You know, it would happen from time to time, and it'd just be like, well, no, that didn't give me what I wanted. Let me try it this way. So, I'm wow. not saying that that means like don't be interested in what the vault has, but it's like that whole idea that it's just like this treasure trove of unreleased songs that you know were you know too good for the records or didn't have, you know, or didn't have, sometimes it was just that certain songs are outliers. They don't have a family. You know what I mean? They're just kind of uh, works in and of uh, their, their self. Okay. Well, since we're on the issue, talking about the vault and things, what do you think of the deluxe edition releases? You know, we've had 1999, Sign of the Times, uh, Purple Rain. Well, I guess I didn't get the deluxe, deluxe, but you know, people are now. You hear a lot of people. They get very excited because you know if they think that there's going to be a Diamonds and Pearls one. Uh, and I don't know if there is or isn't. Or I don't know if you were involved in that, so I'm not asking any of that. But what do you think in general of these types of releases? I think it's a good thing. I mean, I, I, I one thing that frustrates me. Uh. And I'm not even sure I didn't manage to A-B the two, but let's just talk about Sign of the Times. Whenever that record comes up in my iTunes, it's like 3 dB lower than everything else. Like it was mastered yeah. at a very low level. And I haven't bothered to check uh, between the uh, the re-release and the and the old version. Um, There's a difference. If they if they fix that, I don't I don't I haven't even endeavored to to answer that question once again mike you and i here uh i don't know if you're aware of this but we had bernie grunman on one of our shows oh boy and 
And I said the, the exact same thing. Like, Bernie, what's going on here, man? What, what's going on with this new release? He's on Mark. We had, you know, we have newer tech now. You're going to be happy. And it comes out. I get the, you know, the, the super deluxe vinyl. And I also got the um, high resolution flag download. And I'm like, okay, okay, Bernie, what's up? And I put it on. I'm like, oh, wait, yeah, okay. Now right. we're talking. Okay. I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Bernie did his thing on this one. Yeah, well, there's a reason Bernie's Bernie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, well, I'm glad to know that they that Bernie did it right. Uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've listened to it, but I, I hadn't A-B'd it yet. Oh, there's a clear improvement. Oh, yes. Okay. Also, well, there's some songs on, on Sign of the Times, uh, the deluxe the edition that I really liked. I mean, it really um, uh, showed me, because I didn't realize that Wendy and Lisa were still around during that period. Mm. And um, a lot of the outtakes reflect that, 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 you know, the work they did with him, you know, even if they didn't really necessarily get, you know, the credit or the recognition that they, they should have. But, um, yeah, I, I like the Sign of the Times one probably the most so far. Okay. Uh, well, speaking of Sign of the Times, and just to go back to another question, and I guess I know why I put these albums together. So Sign of the Times or Off the Wall. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, wow. I mean, I'm looking at it, you, Mike. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> man! You're catching me at a weird time because right now, I, I'm really like, I've really been like listening to Quincy a lot yeah. lately. Like, I a lot of this stuff was around when I was growing up, but I was interested in. Other kinds of music. I've been mean, living in the Midwest, so you know, I I had a lot of you know, a lot of uh, FM album rock to push through. Mm. You know what I mean? My sisters listened to other music, like you know, and my oldest sister had like uh, Breezin when it came out. You know, I had a sister who had um, which uh, Parliament record was Funk and Teleki. Okay. Versus the police, she had that. Yeah. I've been playing yeah. that recently. That's Heat not... Wave, Too Hot to Handle, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. Mm. Uh, like, there's a lot of varieties of music going on in my household, but um, I'm coming to Quincy kind of late in terms of like uh, his work before that record, like the Dude. Uh, mm. There's songs on the Dude that I didn't know were on the Dude. I, you know, <laughs> it's like like. Uh, 100 Ways with uh, <laughs> James Ingram singing. Mm. I didn't know that was on The Dude. I didn't either. You know, or Razzmatazz. Or, you know, if you listen to that record, you're basically hearing off the wall. Like, I understand why Michael wanted to work with Quincy. And it's funny because I saw an interview with Quincy where somebody was asking him, so what did you have to change, you know, like, what in what way did you have to change your process to work with Michael Jackson? And he was like, I didn't have to change my process at all. <laughs> he, he wanted to work with me, <laughs> you know. And, and, you know, I I I love Quincy because he just kind of shoots straight. But you know, he he upsets a lot of people being so direct. All right, but I can relate. You know why? Uh, because the same thing happens for me, and ironically, we have happen to have the same birthday. I share a birthday with uh, with Quincy Jones. Albert Einstein and uh, uh, Kirby Puckett of all people, <laughs> who used to play for the Twins. Yeah, interesting. Uh, and uh, I'm not, uh, you know, conflating or comparing or saying that, uh, I, you know, as great or not so great or any of that. But I do find myself like I got certain tendencies and certain ways of thinking that that correlate. With, with 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 both Einstein and Quincy, <laughs> Quincy Jones, <laughs> like I'm pretty direct about like I'm I think that I'm a nice guy as long as music's not involved. I think I'm a nice guy actually. As but, long as music's not involved. Yeah, I mean when music's involved, it that's serious to me. 
Okay. Like I'm, I'm looking for a certain kind of result. I'm looking for a certain cohesion and cooperation from the people I'm working with. Mm. And if that doesn't happen, then I, 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 it, it upsets me. And, you know, also, you know, knowing where I came from and the fact that I managed to hang as long as I did, you know, some of those things, you know, that Prince was also about didn't have to be rubbed off on me. I, that's where my head was already at. You know, if you're not giving your best, what's the point? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. do the world a favor and, you know, take on a different job. You know, don't do this. Don't mess with music. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I actually and that reminds me of a story that Levi told me about. Um, he used to ask Prince. Um, he used to ask Prince, like, well, how, why do you like running the show like this where you, you know, you like we don't have a. You could he could start stop you know change songs whatever he felt like it like Levi had come from you know uh, a background of being able to play in a band it's like they got the arrangements down everything's going like it's supposed to go and so you can just sit back and sort of relax and the show plays itself Prince didn't like that Prince wanted it to be a a more interactive experience nightly you know uh, it, it just it, it it needed to feel alive to him like anything could happen. And, and, you know, often things did happen, <laughs> you know, there are more nights than not where we'd be leaving his dressing room, walking to the stage. And all of a sudden he starts, he, the audience is yelling because the lights are out. You know, as soon as they turn the lights out, they're screaming so loud you can't hear yourself, mm -hmm. you know, trying to talk to somebody next to you. But then you have to listen, you know, for Prince saying, uh, you know, Raspberry Beret, Raspberry Beret is out tonight. We're going to do, you know, whatever instead. <laughs> and then you got to remember that, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, until that point comes up in the show. And then remember, oh, yeah, that's right. I got a program change here. We're not doing that. We're doing this. You know, it's like that's that pressure that the, a lot of people don't. They Well, people respond differently to pressure. Mm -hmm. Me, I like it because I know that you can't become a diamond. Without pressure, without the pressure, you're just another lump of coal. The pressure is important, you know. Right, right. And I and I think it's also important that the the crowd, the your audience, your fans get a unique experience from night to night. They don't want you to phone it in, you know. And uh, I think the other thing Prince told Levi was, we don't do this for our enjoyment. We do this for them. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to be up here sitting back and enjoying. We're we're doing this for them, so that's why it's like it is, you know. And that was it. <laughs> wow, but it's, it's, it says a lot. Well, I was going to ask you, like the audience. That's just got to be such a powerful sort of feeling to have all these people screaming. And yeah, it's and yeah. Every once in a while, when I had time to think about something else on stage, uh, I would think to myself, like, "Wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of power." Yeah. You telling thousands of people to do something that they start doing it, they don't even think about it. Clap your hands. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Sing along with me with the video. Sing this here. <laughs> That's a lot of power. Entertainers have a lot of power, man. Wow. Yeah. Well, just, they used to anyway. I think they I mean, still do. Just, just being yeah, used. Just not a... over me. Like I honestly <laughs> I I don't, I'm not interested in anything Cardi B has to say. <laughs> About anything. <laughs> she's on. You know. She's one of these questions on here. Okay. Well, hey. Well, you, you got your answer. <laughs> I'm just saying. That, I mean, there's many, many more, you know, but she's just one example. It's like, well, you know, and then my wife reminds me, like, she ain't, she, they're not marketing her towards you anyway. Mm. You know, <laughs> her or Megan the Stallion. It's like, okay. I'm looking at Megan going, okay. Now, you make these videos and you put them on the glass. And then you get on Saturday Night Live and you stop putting them on the glass long enough to say, we need to protect our women. We need to protect. Our <laughs> she goes on this, you know. Mike's this, going in. Ah, no, no, okay, fine. Fine. Because I'm still hot about it. I'm, I'm like, you got we all have to decide. Are we role models or are we, you know, are, or are we just entertainers? And it's her prerogative to choose, and she can do what she wants. She's Megan the Stallion. She, her, her, you know, her her situation is rolling right along. She doesn't need my support, and that's all right, you know. But 
I don't, I don't, I don't care for that. It's like, you, you know, I understand. I, and I, and I understand all the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the gender politics involved and so on and so forth. Yep. You can wear whatever you want. You can show what you want when you want. Great. Now, when is it a good idea? And vice versa. Like, okay, you you being an advocate, you you using your platform to speak out. I got gotcha, you. I understand. Those young girls are listening to you. Those those girls that are following Megan Thee Stallion. Yeah, I'm sure. They, she's giving them a, a sense of empowerment, and that's great. You know, but for me, I, I got a much more difficult time uh, delineating the two. Now, Mike, I love you. But I have to do this for the show. Oh, oh here yeah. we go. Say it. <laughs> you say all of that, which I don't disagree with you. No, I, but the, you already know where I'm going. So the I other, know where you're going. The other, the other, the other <laughs> side would say, "Well, Michael Blaine, what about what about Princess Ash Cheeks? You know, oh yeah. What, mm-hmm. No, you were on stage and y'all had the what's that? What was that thing based on? It starts with a C. I can't think of it. It, it was, was big. Cal- as, Cal- Cal- Caligula. 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 That was like a big yeah. thing when I was a kid, but I was too young and probably sheltered to actually see what the hell that was. But I knew it was some like, it was some sex thing. It was some, it was too raw for me to watch a young eye. So when I saw Prince sort of taking the imagery, I was like, I know what he's doing there. But I, I'm saying all that to say, but yeah, Mike, you were on stage. Were you not doing one of these types of performances? Oh, no, we definitely were. Okay. We were, um, but and I think there is, well, no, there is a double standard between nudity where women are involved and nudity where men are involved. And um, just in the interest of full disclosure, his ass wasn't really all the way out. There you go. <laughs> I, no, I'm not, I'm not making excuses. It's just that we're going to talk about it. Let's, let's make it factual. For, for sure. Because I, I saw the suit hanging after he had it on. There, there was sheer material in the, in those two cutouts. For sure, it was it was flesh tone. I'm not sure that you know people saw what they thought they saw. Well, the imp- the implication but to the, the, the eyes, implications, yes, that he had because, his ass out. That's that's what we mean. Uh, yes, and that that was a symbolism, definitely. I don't know what made him want to do that. Uh, we only discovered that he was going to do that um, when he uh, broke through the. Uh, the prayer circle to go out the front, out the door of the dressing room. <laughs> and he passed us, and we looked like what the, <laughs> and followed him to the stage. Going, there you see, there you go. What is what is going on? What, what is this? <laughs> he is all right. Well, okay. And yeah, there were people doing unspeakable things in body stockings behind me. Mm. While that oh. that that performance was going on, no, uh, wait, 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 just saw. So are you? I figured they were just simulating things. Are you saying it was more than just fake? Or uh, no, no, we we had a band uh, discussion about it after. Oh, and yeah, we were talking about it amongst ourselves, and there were some freaky things going on back there. Wow! Like some people were like, you know, it was the like it was like their version of the Mile High Club. Really. <laughs> Like, I just did such and such on stage behind Prince during Get Off. Wow, that <laughs> wow. was the NPG Get Down. Uh, it wasn't us. It was them. It was it was those those, those, those dancers from Los Angeles. You know the people are freaky. Uh, wow. Woo. Yeah. I didn't know that. We didn't know this. I, I and I didn't know. I mean, I was face forward. It was. I think uh, it was either Levi or uh, or Tommy who said, you know, man. <laughs> right around the third chorus, this one girl was, uh, you know, I, I don't remember exactly who said what, but the, it a was, legend. there was, there was, yeah, it was, it's a legend. I can't, I didn't wit- witness, I did not bear witness, so a man, I cannot, uh, a man bear witness to what I have not a man witnessed. Right. You so, had heard what had I, happened, but we, uh, yeah, what had happened. We was, don't know if Tony M or Levi. That's they ain't what, got that's what to do they. It. Yeah, I, one of them probably said something too, but um, <laughs> it was like Tony Damon or Kurt. But um, yeah, that I mean. Uh, anyway, to to directly answer your question, I had a lot of equivocation during my tenure with Prince. There was a lot of things that happened that really, you know. Um, uh, 
challenged my my Christian ethics. Mm. You know, and it wasn't always things that were you know matters of sexuality or you know or uh, you know or, or controversy. It was it, it just th- things happened often. I was a young person when I when I when I took that job. I was nineteen, so I was not really in a position to um, to uh, I, I or maybe I didn't feel myself in a position to speak out and and still have a job waiting for me afterwards. Maybe mm. I mean I was uh, I was outspoken about some things, uh, but it was very rare. Can you give us uh, an example of like one of one of these things or oh well um well one example is 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 widely known actually is uh the movie Three Chains of Gold. Okay. Uh I said something to the effect of I didn't understand why Maite was, you know, all, all involved in everything all of a sudden. Like what was her significance? Like what what well, was you she were being real when you said that? I, I was being he said to be real. Uh-huh. And then I was real, and the rest of the band was like, "You dumb mother!" <laughs> like, <"Nigga." laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, listen, <laughs> what you say that for? <laughs> like, Prince, <"Pretty> man, listen. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, oh man, you just stepped in it. But you know, Prince never said one thing about it. Wow, you know. So, I mean, that was one one situation where it's like, okay, well. He was like, "Well, listen. I understand how you feel, but this record is basically centered around her, hmm. and uh, this was like the the symbol album, you know. And uh, the tour really ain't gonna work without her. <laughs> like it's basically, you know, she she, she is the subject. <laughs> so you can go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. And that's uh, oh, okay. Well, all right then." <laughs> What's she doing? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Oh man. Well, that's an example. I mean, and I'll tell you this because it was many many years ago now. But uh, I think we played the Fashion and Music Awards in '95. It was a VH1 thing, and uh, we played P Control. Oh yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember. Specifically, not telling my mom about it because mm. I really didn't want her to see me doing that, mm. playing that, you know, on national television. You know, there was a like a thong drop in the middle of <laughs> in the middle of the song, <laughs> like just it's pussy control on the, uh, you know, on the uh, on the on the waistband. You know, they were like neon green. You know, like a pair of drop right on Carl Carl Lagerfeld's head. <laughs> you know, it was like that. It was like, oh man, well I can't. You know, and I, I did. That's how the show went. But before that, when I knew we were going to do it, like, well, I'm not going to tell my mom about this. And she happened to see it anyway. And um, you know, I saw I caught you on television. Why didn't you tell me you were going to be on? I was like, <laughs> listen, to be honest, I didn't want you to see me on TV playing that. And, you know, think whatever you might think about it. And she, and my mom said, <laughs> she said, oh, I know he's a vulgar man. I just wanted to see you on TV. <laughs> I want to see my baby. Mm-hmm. All right, mom. <laughs> wow. My mom, tell me your mom could say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You know, <laughs> that, you don't, yeah, and the thing is, man, we was, a lot of, I'm not going to say all, but we was raised different. And we knew right from wrong, and we was raised to have respect for our parents and elders. So yeah, doing something like that, you know, you know, I ain't gonna have my my family know. That's not. It's nothing to not. And I'm saying it to say it's not to say Prince is a bad guy or something. But we just know no. how we was raised, and you know where uh-huh. we come from. Certain you know certain values. They're just like, eh, that's doing too much. Too oh, much yeah. that I want my family. To, you know, what I mean, I'm gonna go yeah. ahead and get my bag and doing my job, but. That's exactly, and that's what I did more, more often than not. And my sister Carla, my youngest sister of my, I'm I'm the youngest in the family, but my 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 youngest older sister uh, is about eight years older than me, and I know for a fact that the entire time I was involved in that organization, she prayed a hedge around me that nobody could cut through. Mm. So, I mean, 
we're, we're talking about it for real now, Michael Dean. No, <laughs> I feel like my salvation, the reason why I could leave that organization, you know, with my spirit and my mind intact mm. was, was, was Jesus. It was not, you know, it was my sister praying for me mm. constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as doing the job, um, you know, I probably deluded myself into thinking that is, you know, well, yeah, it's just it's it's a job. You know, it's a if I work for Honeywell. I, as a matter of fact, I remember using this rationalization with somebody. I said a lot of people work at Honeywell. Honeywell builds detonators. They build parts that that go on bombs. You know, All right? That's what they do. Now, you gonna call one of the people working on the assembly line a murderer? Mm. Like, what is it? You know. Like, how do you call it? Right. Well, you, and you see, I, the thing is that you have the stance that you do today where you brought up the Carmens and the Megans. And, and that's the thing. And that's why I was saying, like, back in your day, those performances by Prince, by some older people at the time, may have been considered the same way you consider sure. the, these Megans. I, uh-huh. and, and the fact that maybe the Megans and the Carters will come to a point when they realize I was young and dumb doing this. I, I see the influence I have on these people out here. Maybe, you know, I got to change yeah, well, they, Or is it too late? By that point, they got somebody else. But I don't know. They got to run their trajectory and see how they feel about it. I mean, even right. Prince said at some point, he saw Madonna doing something. And he was like, he said, listen, I've already come to, he said something along the lines of, I've come to the uh, reality that old skin is not good skin. <laughs> you know, yeah, he's, I remember st- that. he's, huh? I remember that quote. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you you know, it comes a point where you, you know, you're better to be modest, you know. And also, if everybody's just got everything hanging out, what you're doing is not special anymore. All right. But, but at the at the moment in, in real time, Madonna is the ex- exact opposite of that right now. Like, she her assed out titties out literally. Yeah. Right. Crazy. That was like, uh, like, probably like bedtime stories time or something like that. Right, like when the you know she had the, the book out and whatnot, and mm-hmm. with Big Daddy Kane in it, and oh my, that was my bro- man. His career took a turn when he puts in that book. <laughs> I was like, hey, well, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> well, I'm sorry, man. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's all right, man. I'm just saying, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's hard to say where these people are going to end up and how they're going to feel about their their legacy. I mean, I I know for a fact that uh, I was complicit, you know. Um, I could have done something else. There are many times that I thought about quitting, but I didn't. It was too convenient. I, you know, mm-hmm. it was Princess Hub is, is Minnesota, is Minneapolis, you know, so it wasn't like I had to be out in L.A. feeling estranged and, you know, going along to get along. Like, I was home. I got to sleep in my own bed every night, you know, for the most part. You know, I mean, my house now, I live, you know, about 13 minutes away from Paisley Park, you know. Um, so it was, you know, I I probably did the easy thing, and uh, I often wonder whether I should have done the 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 hard thing, mm. because the hard thing is really where I'm at now in my in my spirit, uh, and in my heart. Like I realize, and a, a dear friend of mine actually pointed it out to me. Like don't. Don't be afraid to do the hard thing. The hard thing is a different level of gratification from doing the hard thing. Like, don't, you know, don't, don't, don't do what's easy. Do, do, do what's difficult. It's, it's the, the, the reward is much higher. You, you brought up spirit and you're talking about doing the hard thing. Was there, so when you were in the Prince camp or band organization, was there a spirit around that organization? What was the spirit of that organization at the time that you were there? And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> what was the, what did it feel like? Was it an inviting place? Was it a stressful place? Was it unpredictable? Like, what was the spirit if you was a newcomer coming into that at the time you was there? Uh. Stressful, but fun. Definitely unpredictable. You know, um, hard work, but, you know, 
I, I don't think I would have traded my experience necessarily. I, 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 I had I to do it all over again. I don't know that I would have taken that road, but I'm not, I'm not besmirching or, you know, trying to uh, diminish. You know, I, I feel like uh, I, I learned a lot of really good things. You know that that still affect my life to this day. I met a lot of, a lot of people, that are still in my life now. That are just the nicest people, the best people you'll, you'd ever want to know. One thing Prince did do was he his selection process. Like he could sense, like, the potential in a person, mm. and um, I, I just you know I, it, very rarely did any of us you know bump heads you know. Uh, on on any kind of level, I mean, I think everybody was there in the spirit of cooperation, um, and this is I'm talking about like you know anybody involved on the music side of things. Now, also, I I think it needs to be considered that the new power generation is the uh, maybe the the blackest band Prince ever had. Mm, okay, you know, maybe the biggest and maybe the most black folks involved. Um. And uh, can I, I ask? Say, can I just? I don't interrupt you. I'm sorry. When you say that, is that the band, or, or are you talking? What about behind the scenes? Behind that, like the actual other people that must be other people that are working there. It's not just y'all. The, well, the yeah, band. Paisley. There's a, a, a lot of people working there. <laughs> was uh, that blackish? Was that well? Blackish? Well, uh, let me let, let me tell you a story. Oh, oh, sure. Go ahead. My bad. Spike Lee came out to uh, discuss Girl Six with Prince. Mm-hmm. And the first thing he said when he got in the office, he said, where are the black people at? <laughs> Salute, Spike. How come I'm walking in a black man's building and I'm gre- gre- greeted by a, you know, by a white secretary, a white, you know, white phone mm-hmm. operator or whoever it was at the front? And uh, I, I don't honestly remember if I know how Prince responded, but I know that Spike, it's, actually Spike hung out that day. Uh, but Prince brought him into rehearsal. I don't know how they, he, he happened to mention that he asked where, where were all the black people? And I think he might've said something to the effect that he doesn't know that there's no black people in Minnesota, you know, <laughs> but he had a real interesting experience. Uh, Ice Cube directed Love Sign with Nona Gay mm-hmm. and on Ice Cube's set, it wasn't nothing but black people mm. doing everything. So um, I'm not sure what that did to Prince's viewpoint. Maybe it didn't have a real effect at all. I mean, you know, there's more black people in California. That's to be fair. But I mean, you know, uh, on the flip side, uh, I think that uh, um, Spike had a point. But I mean, also, uh, I I don't think the Prince was so necessarily focused on like contemporary race relations at that point. I don't know that that was really what he was, his mind was on, you know? I mean, certainly he had his experiences as a young person and he could tell you about all that, you know, all afternoon, you know, the different ways in which he was discriminated against, not just for his size, but for his color also, you know? Um, Sonny said to me that, uh, he went to hang out with Prince at what's the guy's name? Uh, Chris Moon. Okay. Yeah. At Chris Moon's studio, Sonny went to Sonny and Andre's uncle named Sonny uh, went to like hang out with Prince and see what he was working on and so on and so forth. And Sonny told me that. Chris Moon was saying some kind of racist things while they were there and talking to Prince kind of crazy, you know? And he said something that involved the N-word and and Andre's uncle, Sonny, snatched him up. <laughs> mm. And was like, if you ever, you know? <laughs> like, he, Sonny was like, man, that dude was crazier than me. Like, <laughs> like, like he, was pack, he was packing on the north side way back. Okay. Uh, and he didn't. He didn't appreciate how this dude was talking to Prince. And now I, I talked. I, I brought this up to to Andre, and he said, "No, no, man." It, I said, "Well, Sonny Thompson said it, you know." <laughs> hmm. and, really? 
And so I don't know, you know, I don't know if, uh, I don't even know if Andre's uncle is still alive, but I, you know, Andre found it hard to believe because he thought this dude was a peace loving, you know, and maybe he was until he heard what he heard and then he did what he did. Mm. But, uh, you know, it's hard to say, but I, I guess I'm, to say all that, uh, Spike had a point and I'm sure Prince, it registered with Prince, although he probably wasn't really ready to you know, like gut his entire, you know, <laughs> the entire staff and start over and try to get people to, you know, up to speed. You know, he may he may have found it, uh, you know, he may have uh, actually the last time I was at Paisley, there was almost nobody there. Like when I was there working with Prince, it was like nobody, no, no, no staff, you know, like. I think like Kirk and maybe like a couple other people. It was just like the last session I did with Prince was about a month before he died. And it was, uh, it was me and uh, Mono Neon was in the control room. We, like we never actually got to speak. We played together, but we didn't get to talk to each other at all. I didn't even see him. I just uh, I heard him playing in the, in the control, you know, uh, through my headphones. Like, Oh, okay. I know who that is. <laughs> all right. And, uh, Oh, who's the, the horn player? Uh, is his name? Is his name Andre? Oh, uh, Adrian. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Crutchfield. Yes, Adrian. It was it was Adrian, me, uh, Mono, and Prince, and it was he was experimenting with like kind of making a fusion record. I think this and, is that black is the new. There's a title out there about what this is called. Yeah, okay, that's cool. I mean, I don't think that I think. Kirk probably ended up playing drums on it instead of whatever I I did because uh, for some reason it just like it wasn't Prince just kept changing his mind and going no I don't like that either uh, no well let's try this well go back to that and mm -hmm. like the whole situation it was unlike any experience I'd had him in, had in the studio with him before what do you mean uh, by that just that he was so uh, indecisive huh. um. But it, for whatever reason, it's like whatever I was doing was was not what he wanted. <laughs> and the drums was kind of set up in a way because uh, he was doing his own engineering at that time. Like I couldn't really move anything around, you know, like they were set to do something else. And so the experiment didn't really work. But um, uh, I, I, this is all off the point. But I mean, I do remember he came out to talk to me and say, well, thanks, you know. I'll probably have Kirk redo it just because, you know, it's set up really for him to play. And I, you know, it's like we just got limitations here. I said, That's cool, man. I, you know, uh, you know, I was happy to give it a go. And uh, I remember look, kind of looking in his face and, I, you know, I, I uh, he would get like like thinner than usual uh, sometimes when he'd be working in the studio and just not not taking in any sustenance, really. He'd just be in a zone. Um, but his attitude would be different. It's, he would be a little more, uh, uh, like, a little more on, like a little more, you know, uh, more awake than that, like more focused than that. Um, but he still had the look of uh, kind of being, not. I don't want to say emaciated. It's like I thought to myself, like, is there something wrong? You know, and I think I almost said something, but like, who, <laughs> who am I to, to question his situation? I got my own issues with my body and whatnot. So I figured what, whatever he would probably, you know, return to his normal, you know, routine at some point. But um, when you feel like that, are you, is it kind of like, because he is Prince and, you know, you're kind of saying, who am I to tell him? Like, is he, do you see him as something other than just like, if he was a normal guy? Say, hey, man, what the fuck is wrong with you? What are you, you all right? Uh, no, I mean, I generally stay out of people's business on that level anyway. Okay. Right. Not just because he was Prince. I just like, you know, it's not really, uh, I, I guess I really believe in letting people live whatever way they, they, they choose to, mm. you know, um, I, that's all. I mean, I don't really have anything else to put on that. It wasn't because he was Prince. It was just because, like, I'm, oh, well, all right. Well, maybe he's going through something, you know. And, you know. It's, Minding our business. I, I yeah. I just, yeah. It's just, uh, you know. I mean, I think that um, 
uh, my relationship with Prince, like even you know, from the age of nineteen to to the age of you know forty seven or forty eight, whenever that was, when when he passed, you know, the 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 dynamic don't change really. Mm. It's like he was kind of like a a father figure to me. So there's a like there's a reverence involved. Right, I got you. He's still the older cat. Like older he's cat. yeah, he's still yeah. he's still yeah, he's still the older cat, and. Uh, I still will, you know, I would respect him just the same as I did when I was 19. Yeah, I can so, that. Yeah. you know, it just, it's just a thing. It's like certain people I get around, it catapults me back to a different time in my life. And it was like that with him. It's like our, the dynamic never changed. I think maybe he got, I mean, he got nicer and more appreciative, mm -hmm. but... You know, I mean, I've also, it's like, you know, I think back to my first experiences with him. He was he was always like that. You know, it wasn't until we got into like the hard part that he, these other colors in his, in his rainbow started to shine, <laughs> you know. But uh, so it was nice to have that experience every once in a while and not have all the anxiety and stress that went with it. You know, when it was, you know, when I was under his employ, you know. Gotcha. You may have said this before, and I'm, if I don't remember, I'm sorry. You just made a statement. You said, but when it got to the hard part, going back to when y'all were in the band and stuff, remind us what, what was the change that made it from being not the hard part? Like, why did it get hard all of a sudden? Was it something that, he started to change or do you guys change? Like what made it become an issue? I think that uh, for all intents and purposes, as long as Rosie was around, it was, it was, it was almost all gravy. Mm. When, when he had to face the fact that she was moving on, she was going, I think uh, a different, uh, a different something in him that started to something in him started to emerge, you know. And I think uh, as as it got whittled down to us who were the last, you know, four or five, you know, five including Maite, when it was just me and Sonny and Morris and Tommy and her, like it just it's we had it was much easier to to bring us together to congregate. <clears throat> so maybe it was uh, that uh, we were around more often and saw more. It could be. It's, it's hard to say exactly. Hmm. But um, yeah, it's, it's, times times get hard. People people were leaving. Uh, you know, he was. Uh, you know, and by the time he got involved in the whole thing with Warner Brothers, dude. I mean, no one could blame him for being angry. You know. But uh, I, I think that uh, he, well, I, well, I, I think no matter how you slice it, uh, he was a true Gemini. If if not, you know, if 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 I, I mean, it's funny. This is the other thing I was gonna say, man. Um, I don't know for a fact, but in retrospect, when I look back now, uh, I really think the prince was bipolar. I mean, but you know how it is with us, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we're just now starting to seek out, you know, <laughs> right. Get some, start talking to people. And yeah. It's just counseling. now happening for black folks, right. you know, and you know what? Uh, and that's just a, a speculation on my part. I don't have any evidence or proof or anything to say, but he would just change a lot, like from one moment to the next sometimes, you know? And, uh, you know, different levels of, you know, trusting or not trusting people around, you know, I'm not saying that he was paranoid. I think that he was, I, I really think if you really want to go back to the source, I think he was never really as close with a band as he was with the revolution after that whole thing stopped. Mm. I think he may have felt like he shared too much of himself and that he wanted to be, you know, treat things, you know, more professional from that point forward. Um, but um, what I was going to say is that it upsets me that um, 
I, I'm recognizing a correlation between the fact that mental health is just now starting to be talked about with black people and the fact that in almost every major shooting or like mass shooting in the history of this country, the first thing they want to observe, if they were white, the first thing they want to talk about is their psychological state. Mm -hmm. Like they never asked that about us. They expect black people to be hardened to everything and to have developed the intestinal fortitude <laughs> <laughs> to deal with whatever it is that they dish out. And uh, it, 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 it upsets me. It also saddens me that, well, I mean, I guess I'm coming full circle with the conversation because we were talking about the Constitution and the fact that Black people were, were, were only considered three-fifths human, and that was an afterthought. You know, and I think that the, the, the dehumanization of black people in this country, it's, I mean, how long can you go before you start to believe or give in to what people are telling you about yourself? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have really anything else on that. Okay, okay. Uh, but... Uh, you know, uh, I had a, a, a revelation one day, which is that, you know, genius is is next door to insanity. <laughs> it's like you can't most of us. Most of us are crazy. Most musicians. The reason you make music is because you got something inside you that you need to express that words aren't going to do. Mm. Words, words, words can't do it. You know, Uh so I'm not calling Prince crazy. I'm not saying Prince was crazy, but he flirted with, you know, the margins in, in, a, in a way that I never would have the, uh, the, the brevity to like, to, to go like, and, and, you know, we could have been better friends <laughs> if I had been, if I had given in more to that impulse, but it's not like me. I wasn't raised like that. My life didn't say that. I, I'm, my energy moves like a cloud, slow and specific in its pattern. Prince was like lightning. You know, I mean, I've had a lot of time to think about this, and I'm sorry. I don't mean to wax rhapsodic no, or anything like you, that. You're good. I'm just saying I, it occurred to me one day. It's like he liked to stay out there teetering on that edge. And that ain't me. I'm not. My sense of adventure doesn't doesn't. Push me into a place where I got to see, well, how, just how far can I take this? You know, and that was Prince. Prince wanted to know how much, how, well, how much, how much is in there? I mean, from, you know, I mean, I, I saw, <laughs> saw an interview of uh, Jimmy Jam talking about, you know, I got the parts together. He was at the, like, the first rehearsal at the time. Like he was playing most of the parts with one hand. And Prince was like, well, you got another hand over there, man. What, what, what are we going to do with that? Mm. You know? So then he started doubling the bass lines with Terry. And then, well, okay, well, we got some, these cats are doing choreography. What you going to do? You know, Jimmy was playing with both hands, doing choreography and singing backgrounds. <laughs> you know, that, and that's Prince. He's like, okay, what can we do here? You know, how can we, you know, how can we, how can we be even, be even better? You know, <clears throat> but I think that, that attitude in general in a person can lead into, you know, <laughs> it can lead to some dark territory, you know? Hmm. But uh, it just wasn't me. We could have been, we could have been really good friends if I, if I wasn't uh, so boundary oriented. Like what and were he, some of the boundaries? What do you, I mean, you, can you specifically, just, like, was there something that he was wanting you to do or get involved? Oh, in? I mean, there's like, you know, like there's, I, I'll give you one specific, specific example. And oh, uh, rest in peace to, to DJ Brother Jules, by the way. Absolutely. Um, this, uh, I, I'm actually about to, uh, um, I was going to make a comment about like the process of making Exodus. Um, you know, there were times when we were recording like those segues and, and whatnot. 
<laughs> you know, and Prince had, you know, a lot of it scripted, scripted and ready to go. And he, okay, your line is this. And, you know, and I would, he would always try to give me a line that had some cursing in it. <laughs> and and he didn't know to me to be somebody who, you know, I didn't, I didn't curse. I didn't, none of the really bad words anyway. Uh, you know, and I'm like, I'd say, I don't talk like that, man. I, I don't feel comfortable saying that. I see. You know, and, but yet, you know, I mean, anybody can hear it. You know, he, <laughs> Sonny did enough cussing for all of us, you know, but. <laughs> You know, I see. I was listening to that, thinking that's how y'all really were. I was like, "Oh, man, guys oh are nuts. Uh, no, man, we t- <laughs> we just Midwestern black folks, man. We're not that, you know, that colorful. <laughs> you know, not really. And you know, and I, and I, you know, I can't speak for Sonny, but I don't. I, he probably didn't feel very good about that. I, you know, after it was all said and done, he probably didn't want to leave that in, in the yeah. world either. You know. Wow. But I mean, that record is. I think it's a great record, and I think it. Um, oh yeah. But it definitely was like I felt like it was Prince's way of dealing with what was going on with Warner Brothers, in a way you know it, it, that it couldn't legally come back on him. So, man, I was just listening to that about a month ago. That album is hilarious. It's like, hilarious, but there's a lot of that's that's like there's a lot of there's a lot of reality on that record, man. Yes, I mean, yeah. you know, in, in the video of the Good Life where they got the dude kicking Sonny out the music store, like that type of thing used to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, uh, you know, I mean, it's I'll never forget Prince telling me one day he said, Michael Bland, he said, <laughs> there was a time in my life where. All I could do was stand outside McDonald's and smell the fumes. Damn. You know, like, you know, any any equivocation over whether or not Prince knew where he came from. Prince knew where he came from, you know. <laughs> he just always had big dreams, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's that's an example. You know, just of a situation where it's like, I, I don't I don't really talk like that. I don't really want to put that imprint you know, on the conscious world, like mm-hmm. that ain't me. So that's I just see. one example of a situation where it's like, yeah, yeah I guess if I was, you know, a uh, 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 trout mouth heathen, you know, and I'm not <laughs> saying he was, but had my had my boundaries or standards been different, I would have just gone. I wouldn't have thought twice about it. You know, because they have those people. Prince asks you to do something, you probably will do it. Right, because yeah, you Sonny's sp- smashing females on the album. Yeah, it was, <laughs> that's, you know, that's how we really were. Yeah, I was like, man, they getting it in over there. MPJ, no joke. <laughs> I, I, you know, well, I mean, even if we were, I couldn't tell you on on, on this. You know, I mean, it's it was still rock and roll. Oh, you know, I'm sure. just, you know, but you know, I'm, I I mind my own business, Michael Dean. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave you alone on that. Oh, so one day we're gonna have to do a, 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 a an off the record. Little convo between you, me, and uh, uh, and Big Sexy, because uh, I feel like you guys are actually my brethren. I know we don't really know each other, but I feel like I know y'all. Oh, man. And uh, yeah, yeah, mutual, I'll, I'll, mutual. I'll open up the personal vault to to y'all sometime when you ain't got nothing better to do. Just, okay. We'll just jump on, and right. I'll, I'll give you a few stories that that can't be uh, made public. Lord. Lord. Well, let me say <laughs> this then on that topic, uh, Mike, um, <laughs> and I'll say this publicly. When we get back to regular touring, when you come up through Northern California, dude, let's sit down and break bread and hang out. Uh, well, yeah, I, uh, definitely. Um, I uh, I just don't know when we go 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 be back e- in California. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you, you y'all in San Francisco are close by. I'm in Sacramento. Mike's up in uh, the north. Up where? Sorry, I'm in Seattle. It's west. Oh, Seattle! Wow, Seattle. ain't nobody in San Francisco. I got it all messed up. Yeah. All right, but um, all right. Got uh, let me go back. To, we'll go back to some questions that'll spark some. Questions. All right, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and, we, and we've already mentioned this person, but just to throw it in there because I was being stupid. Carmen Electra or Cardi B? <laughs> oh, here you go, man. <laughs> Listen, I'll go on record and say this. I mean, and again, you're talking about the difference between somebody I actually, you know, hung around. I know. And somebody I know. And I'll tell you this, that, you know, people can think whatever they want about Carmen Electra, but she's one of the only women I ever saw involved with Prince on that level. 
that was super respectful of everybody else the whole time. Hmm. Like it didn't matter whether you were stymie, like the uh, the custodial it's custodial engineer, or somebody in the band, anybody. She was she was not too full of herself to 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 say hello and ask how they were doing. You know. Okay. So that that means a lot to me when like you you know when when the uh, you know when you got the privilege but you don't feel like you need to use it. Mm. Like I'd rather be human about stuff. Yeah. And you you seen so you you were around when there was Carmen Electra, of course Maite is there, Noni Gay. Oh, you trying to start uh, something? What, what? <laughs> these are all Prince uh proteges and artists that you work with, right? Yeah, I was there. <laughs> I'm trying to remember who else was. I don't think there was anybody else. So I was trying to get you to say, "Oh yeah, what about the?" <laughs> I forgot that. Yeah, my... <laughs> I'm trying to close the door. Nope, nope. There was no, nobody else. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, for sure. That was a busy what, time, though. I would say. The, the, <laughs> I that was a busy time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you're in the when you're in the band, do you see that as a busy time as well? Like you like, wow, this guy's okay. Well. Or are you just like <sighs> uh, <laughs> I'm teetering on something here, man, because I want to <laughs> say something. I don't know if I can say it. Um Listen, I, you know, I don't personally know exactly the, uh, the nature of all those relationships. Like I, I, we all speculate, but I can't say 100% who, who was what to Prince during, during that time period. Mm. But I, I do know this, <laughs> that I think it was maybe it was like NWA, uh, not NWA, uh, NBA All-Star Weekend, mm -hmm. like when we shot like The Beautiful Experience. Yep. They were all three there. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and Fritz was cool as a cucumber. <laughs> he was, I've never seen somebody so comfortable in the face of potential uh you know catastrophe <laughs> yes <laughs> yes i i was like wow uh, like that's a different level right there that's a player <laughs> yeah i'll say that it was like he was not shook one bit <laughs> And I I like, we don't hear enough about that that prince, I, but but I can tell well, that he must be. But the, then again, maybe he didn't have reason to be. Right. You know, I don't really know. I'm just saying from all, all if I was going to look at it the way, you know, people, you know, outside the organization looked at it, you know, they probably speculated that maybe it was, you know, it, you know, there was a, you know, all sorts of things going on. But whatever was going on. You see, I ain't never seen somebody so so cool. <laughs> we leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, got another one for you. This is fun, but not fun. Maybe uh, Je uh, uh, <laughs> Jesse Smollett or Tawana Bradley. Bradley. Oh man! Like who am I gonna believe? <laughs> Is he the uh, new Tawana Bradley? Ooh. Well, wait a minute. Now, did was there ever evidence pointing to the fact that, that she lied, or was that just conjecture? Well, and I don't have that in front of me, so I don't know the absolute answer Big to Sexy, that. you're the legal expert here. Yeah. You know, the evidence originally presented had been discredited, and there was nothing to really offset that, you know, and to her credit she didn't have an agenda along the lines of uh, uh -huh. small too right you know. well then i'm going with well, i don't know if he had an agenda i mean you could oh, argue wow. kind of both ways on these guys like who, who's to say that what he says didn't actually happen to him it just may well, not have happened the way that he described it i i take it a step further i'd say maybe it didn't happen to him but maybe he knows somebody who would happen to that's 
possible. And and that, you know, some people, you know, sometimes they do the, the wrong thing for the right reason. Hmm. Maybe he thought that, you know, more more media attention need to be placed on such things happening. You know, I mean, it's it's funny because uh, uh, somebody in 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 his position is tantamount to me to uh like you know i guess it's it's uh, again i'm all kind of on the like well when white people do it it's different <laughs> like for instance like you know just the fact that studies can i said earlier studies can be sanctioned anything you want to try to prove about anybody you know if you put some money behind it you can find and somebody will manufacture proof of that right you, you, you know, know what you know what he did he pulled the Karen. Yes, you can it see the on him. Yeah, you see the difference though. <laughs> you try Again, to pull a Karen. When versus... black people do it, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, he pulls the Karen, uh -huh. and I think his mistake. And I actually heard shout out to Willie D. Ghetto Boys. He said that uh, Jesse Smollett un underestimated white supremacy, and he was saying uh -huh. because when he threw the whole, it was MAGA people that did it. It's, it's, it's kind of like when you as a white person, that, you know, very sensitive to be about being called a racist. Uh -huh. like, it's like, I don't, I didn't. And I think when you have even sort of the, the right or whatever, I'm not on either side, but when you have them and, and they see a black guy, oh, you're calling us a racist and we didn't have nothing to do with that. We're going to yeah. make an example out of you pulling mm -hmm. this. And I think too, once you go back and if you remember all some of the politicians that were kind of jumping on his bandwagon at the time, you know, tweeting about this, and they got they got Kamala Harris tweets important. Just you know, I think that added another level of oh, it's going to be even bigger than just this dude doing this. It's a political thing, and then, then plus the police, we're going to make an example out of you. If you'd have just said it was some black guys that jumped me and stopped at that, I don't really think we'd even be here today about it. They'd be just like, oh, okay, it's mm -hmm. another assault. Yeah, no big deal. But when he threw that MAGA. And yeah. then he saw, and then the politicians jumped on. They were, oh, they were like, oh yeah, you you gonna be made mm -hmm. an example of this guy. Oh yeah, yeah. He, uh, yeah, he, um, he, 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 yeah, he, uh, he definitely was that. He was made an example of, I think. And uh, also, I mean, the the big problem is that, you know, if it was proven that he's lying, then at the next time or any time the real thing happens. You know, it's it's uh it's going to be called into question the same way. Uh, well, you yeah, know, that, you but they're going to call it into question anyway. Well, we know, we know they're going. <laughs> yeah. They don't need this this little. Mm -hmm. But but I hear what you're saying. That's fair. I'm just saying it's like that's what it does. Is it, sure. it like white people have any faith in us in that respect anyway? But it's it certainly doesn't help that you know he handed that over for them to to hold over the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, and then Tawana, Tawana, Bra Tawana Bradley, I think I said her name right. Brawley, Brawley, and that was that was the, yeah, that was the big one when we were younger. And yeah. Al Sharpton was out front, and I know for a lot of people that oh, see Al, he he was in the Tawana thing. Don't they discredit him. Yeah, they tried. But, you know. They tried. So, would you say right. cute? I mean, would you say uh, big sexy? He said, <laughs> 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 see, you yeah, don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't like Al. That's all right. That's all right. I have a problem with Al. Yeah. You got a problem with Al? Uh -oh, I have a problem go. with Al. Well, I, well, I mean, yeah, we. I'm, I'm curious to know what what it is. You know. I will be glad to tell you, Mike. Yeah, brother to brother, brother, yes, brother to brother. You know, music man to music man. Yeah. And I was just made aware of this within the last couple of years. Back when Whitney Houston first hit the scene with her first album, apparently Mr. Sharpton didn't like it and went on his radio show and called her Whitey Houston. Whoa! Exactly, exactly. And I kind of—I have a huge problem with that. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, but I, I got to say honestly, if if you're gonna go after 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 Al on that, you got to go after a lot of black folks. Okay. I'm, I'm not saying don't. <laughs> he said okay. I'm just saying it's, it's he was stating a a semi popular opinion. In the black community, I think. I think that her sound was less urban 
And uh, so he got booed, remember? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I mean, show. so uh, he wasn't saying nothing that we hadn't already heard, but and I'm not saying that he was right to say it, but um, it was a familiar sentiment, you know, to attack someone because you don't like their music like that. Man, that's some bullshit. I don't think that it's because of her music. I think it's it's really because she was they they kind of groomed her to be a crossover artist. They they I don't even think it was crossover. I think they groomed her to, to be a pop to artist. Be a, to be a pop artist, period. And at the time when she came out, that was um I don't I I really think that they did it because um it meant more money. I mean black artists weren't weren't suffering at that point. Not really. I mean Lionel Richie was killing it. Prince, Michael Jackson, you know, Luther. Like, it, they didn't have to do that. They could have let her be, I mean, well, who knows? I didn't know Whitney is, and I don't know if she was being more authentic to herself or not. But, you know. I think that you're right. The way it felt, though, to the it felt the like people, it was a, it felt it like was it a was, get. It was yeah. a, it was a money grab. It's like, yeah, you're trying to, you're making, trying to make her the, the, the black Ooh. Barbara Streisand, you know? And, uh, she and it wasn't came. her talent that was being booed. It was, it was. We all knew she could sing. It was like, the yeah. institution yeah. that we were booing. Yeah, but I feel you, big sexy. You know, I know you are a a a, a, a <laughs> what a, a smart and 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 formidable. You know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh... You smart and formidable. That's all. <laughs> it's not, and not even a size thing. It's just like I think you speak with authority. You know, good save. You know, it's just I'm a, I'm a music cat from day <laughs> one. You know, and it's, yeah, I just I just I, mean, I had no opinion of Al other than loud sweatsuits back in the day, one way or the <laughs> other. And then I saw this and the perm. I'm like, dude, come on, man. Yeah. Yes. Now, I understand. I, 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 I get where you're coming from, man. I understand it. I'm well, Mike, mm -hmm. let me ask you, let me jump in with a music question here. Sure. On, on your either, on the either or premise. Assuming you saw them both live. <laughs> Sammy Hagar, David Lee Roth. Oh, wow. With, uh, with Van Halen. <laughs> uh, I, see, I saw them both. I saw them both. Okay. I, I, I met Sammy when we played the the uh, MTV Video Music Awards in '91. They, I think Van Halen. They they played Pound Cake. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, one of my uh, favorite moments in in all my uh, you know working with Prince was watching Eddie Van Halen and Prince have a have a conversation at Universal. Whoa, 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 whoa. what? <laughs> Prince and Eddie were, were, they, it was only a couple minutes, but they, you know, we had finished our sound check and we had hung around for theirs. And Prince was kind of talking to Dick Clark or somebody. And Sammy and Eddie came walking around and they both greeted Prince. And Sammy kept walking, but Eddie stayed. And I mean, I wasn't close enough to hear what they were saying, but they were laughing a lot. And Prince had this, uh, this kind of, uh, it's a it's an outfit he's been fo been photographed in. It was like a white pinstripe uh, one piece that was kind of like a vest on the top. Hmm. Um, anyway, I looked up and Eddie and, and Prince were talking, and Eddie said something. He started smiling, and he he went to touch Prince's lapel. He's like like he's like I like that. That's real sharp, man. I used to wear something like this. It was like that sort of thing, and Eddie did he used to wear something like that. Hmm. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. Like it was like a like a, a a sleeveless kind of vesty looking thing on top. It kind of was like a jumpsuit. So that conversation I really would have liked to have uh, been in on. But uh, Sammy came by, said, "Hey, oh hey, hey, how's it going, Sammy? Yeah, oh hey, great man, good to meet you." You know, and uh, and Eddie stood, st you know, hung back, talked to Prince for a minute, and then he rolled by and he, you know, he waved. And said, "Hey, but uh, uh, if I had to pick between the two, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I know that uh, that David Lee Roth, he, you know, he's <laughs> he ain't what he used to be, but I'd still rather see David. 
Agreed. Agreed. No disrespect towards Sammy, you <laughs> no. know, but I saw them back in 81 and it was just incendiary. Now, Sammy's the better singer. Oh, yeah. But entertaining wise, like like you said earlier, with Dave, you don't know what you're going to see. Mm-hmm. You know, you got that swag, great. man. Yes. He's got more. He just has more swag and more style. I feel like. Okay. But uh, okay. I like that. Especially was, was, that, that. Was, was that on uh, like the the Jimmy Kimmel show? Yeah, Where, like like yeah. somebody was in the wrong key and and you know and and, and Roth just kind of rolled with it. It was funny. He's like, "Oh, something's going on here." <laughs> <laughs> he said something, <laughs> but you know, I mean, he but his he just his good humor got him through it. You know, I just like that. He like he was like, "Okay, well, something's messed up. It ain't me." Somebody needs to fix something, but hey, I'm out here getting my camera time. So I, I like him for that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, well, all right. Well, per, I got another music one for you. All right. <laughs> if you could be in the band of either one of these groups, one you've been in before, Prince. Or Sly and Family Stone. Ooh. Back when they were, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I um I uh had the good fortune of sitting down with a drummer named Andy Newmark, who uh played on Fresh by Sly and the Family Stone and uh, toured subsequently with Sly. And we sat, uh, it was during the NAMM show one year, many years ago. We sat, we, we sat and uh, traded stories about our experiences. And I got to tell you, to be honest, it's, uh, it's almost the same. <laughs> it's almost the same, you know, w- without the drugs, without the PCP. <laughs> wow. That says like, a lot, actually. <laughs> well, he said that, uh, you know, Sly had him working day and night. Uh, and uh, it got to the point where Sly called and said, I'm going to send some, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to send, send, send the limo. And he told Sly over the phone, he was like, I'm not going. I'm not coming, man. And Sly sent the limo anyway. <laughs> and the two big dudes with the with the three-quarter leather coats and machine guns <laughs> knocked on his door. He opened the door. They literally, he said they lifted him off the ground and put him in the limo. Man. Yeah. So that Sly was literally jacking. Yeah, drunk. like <laughs> it ain't even about. To, yeah, it's not it's not about what you want. It sounds some early death rows. <laughs> kind of. I mean, I don't. I wouldn't say that it was. It was exactly that work of reference, but you kind of knew that. Like, if you know, if you said no, you knew what the stakes might be. Yeah. Man. Oh, now you reminded me of something I wanted to ask you. About. I don't know if we asked you this. Maybe we did ask you this the last time, but we have talked about this many times in the show before. Uh, Miko and Prince. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that's all I had to say, right? Man, what is it? What do you want me? What, what, what is the question? Well, we've heard Miko's, he gave a great version of being well, in the I, midst of it. But what did you see? <laughs> <laughs> At first, I thought they were playing, and then it turned real serious. <laughs> I thought they were just kind of joking around. What I mean, I haven't heard Miko's account of it, but um, we were rehearsing for the new tour, obviously, and it was uh, we were playing Kiss. We were running the set, playing Kiss, and Miko stopped. Uh, stop playing and moving for a you know a split second to like uh, I don't remember if he tuned his guitar or he did something he ch- changed the setting or something something he he stopped to do this like he maybe he tuned a string or something and uh, and 
And your prince was like, I don't know what. And like, oh, what's wrong? What's happening? Yeah. And uh, you know, Miko was like, oh, I did such and such and so on and so forth. And the prince was like, well, well, don't do that. You know, and definitely don't stop dancing. You know, and then there was some, you know, a little more banter, a little quiet banter, but it was like, uh, you know, the every it just escalated out of nowhere, man. I mean, I know there's footage, there's footage out there of it, yeah. But um, you know, it's like Prince was like, "Boy, I will," you know, like I'm talking about he was go <laughs> go take me go out to the parking lot, and, you know, and like beat him like he was his dad or something like like that, <laughs> and Mika was like. He's like, I ain't stupid. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna sock you on your own property. We can meet in the Glen's parking lot across the street. The 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 donut manufacturers, uh, <laughs> their place was across across Audubon from Paisley. Like, I'll beat your little ass at McGlynn's, you know. Prince <laughs> <laughs> was like, boy, you don't come in here talking to me like you. You better, you know. And, uh, they wow. both kind of they stormed off. And uh, and Levi, uh, not Levi, uh, Miko, went, uh, I apparently went back, you know, to his to his room, you know, wherever he was staying at, and packed and headed to the airport. Right. You know, and I, I'm gathering that Prince must have apologized because he, you know, he was there again, you know, like either the next day or the day after that. Now, when but, Prince uh, went, started saying what he said, had you seen that side of Prince before? Or? Or were you no, used that to, was a, uh, you know, and I think he might have been also upset because uh, I think, well, <laughs> uh, Miko was like 6'2", you know, and there was a line on the stage that those dudes knew they weren't supposed to cross, like a point of comparison. Interesting. So I think Miko might have been dancing a little too far up front. Oh, like for Prince to even notice what he was doing, that was peculiar to me. Okay, so like he was, if he was in Prince's sight line, you know, it, it's uh, he was he may have been uh, in a different position than than he was supposed to be. Uh, but again, it's like, I mean, what did Miko say? Anything from, from similar to what I just said? It, it's, it's similar. I think he was going more into the details of the words, but I think he said he did leave. I think he said he came back that night. There was something going on or something, but then they said they, they squashed it up. Yeah. But yeah, it wasn't. You know. But they would fight from time to time was what my understanding was. And also, you know, it's funny because Miko, I, I think he was just, he'd, he'd had enough because I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm remembering now that we were at Wembley, Wembley Arena and Fink said something, and <laughs> and Miko jumped up on him. Hey, listen, Fink, you know, yeah, yeah. and and Gilbert came came walking down uh, the hallway to our dressing room, and Miko was standing out in the hall. He was like, G -g and he said something to Gilbert, like, "Dude, you better take your ass back down there," you know. <laughs> like he said Miko something to the effect of, "Like he said, like you know, so he said some something like." Uh, <laughs> He said, all the muscles don't mean nothing, man. Yeah, he said, he said so something open. about, yeah, all those muscles don't mean anything, man. Strength is in the heart. I whoop your ass too, something like that. <laughs> you know, think if you ever, you know, he turned back on fake. It's like, I think that Miko may have just been tired of it all. You know, and I he think was, he was done, done. <laughs> yeah, he was done, done. And then I think the, the first thing we were supposed to do when we got back was go on Arsenio with Tevin Campbell. Oh, okay. And uh, we did Round and Round from the Graffiti Bridge movie. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, Miko either didn't like the money or there wasn't much money, you know, or maybe it was conflicting with whatever plans he had, but I, he was just like, nope, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> For some reason, he said no. And that's actually how Sonny got in the band. Huh. And another thing people don't know is that, uh, well, you know, Sonny and Tommy and I and Margaret Cox, we were all the backup band for Mavis Staples on the new tour. Oh. Okay. So, I mean, I, I can only uh, suspect that Prince and Miko weren't getting along so well the entire time because at some point they gave Sonny 
a show of the tape and a pig nose amp and like a guitar and said, you should start learning our show. Hmm. So <laughs> I think that they were worried that Mika was just going to quit and roll out. But Sonny was practicing in his room to, to take over for Miko if that was the case. Wow. You that know. just makes me think of, and, I, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, but mm-hmm. sort of the, the black men in Prince's camp who walked away. It's like a, um, you know, like a Morris, Andre. Well, I mean, what, what are you trying to say, D? I'm not trying to, I don't know if I'm trying to say anything. I just, it just kind of, I'm thinking, I was like, it's interesting. Sometimes it's like the brothers, like I've had enough. And yeah, I move mean, move on. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, in the case with 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 Morris Day, I think it, he was he was Frankenstein's monster. I think <laughs> I think the time was Princess Frankenstein's monster. Mm-hmm. Like Princess Frankenstein and the monster just went ah, <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't expect the monster to do that because <laughs> B was like, man, let me tell you, man. <laughs> He said, Mikey, it got to the point where he was coming into our rehearsal trying to tell, you know, trying to still, you know, be involved in the range of the show. And, and, and Morris would be like, shut up. You know, <laughs> like Morris just got to the point where he's like, I don't need to hear from you, man. We just got finished whooping y'all on the road. Right. You know, I think it was just he put together the time and they were too good. Oh, I wish there was cameras cell phone cameras back then boy i'd love to oh, see some man. time oh man i mean just story. that one what is the show is it from like the 1982 like there's a there's i think they played like roy wilkins auditorium here in minnesota or the met center and it was like the three bands it was Eighty Six, mm. the time and prince mm-hmm. and uh man the time just they were just ruthless man they <laughs> Yeah. Just Jesse alone was just like so, just just fire, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. He, yeah. I mean, he, he. I mean, just the fact that that click right there, and with Prince, that was a. I mean, that was a phenomenal mm-hmm. crew of people. Uh, yeah. Imagine if you had the visionary to say, "Jimmy Jam and y'all, yo, come on, stay." Get them another boot, you know, room where they can go ahead and make their, their music in and just keep it, you know, kept it all. Like, I mean, he just had the, he had like the whole Avengers right there, man. They just He had it, it all there, but I, I, I mean, we all got an ego, you For know. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't say that Prince acted any differently in the situation than most people would would have, you know. You're trying to maintain control over a situation and it's slipping out, you know, it's, it's, it's slipping out. You can't, you can't, you know, harness. You gotta let people shine. I just feel like you just go ahead and let Morris and them shine. That's making you money. Well, you can't be afraid of that. You know what I mean? Like, Michael, them Dean, be you do know that on, on that, on that fateful tour, that the time was off the bill for, uh, I do know that the shows in New York and in LA. That's what I'm saying. Let them shine. No. Just, uh uh-uh. uh, back then the way the press worked was the press only really came from New York and L.A. and then was shared, you know, towards the middle of the country. Uh, that any bad reviews like that? That was Prince was that was it was he didn't want to take the risk. I I understand that. I just feel that's like him, that's if him it doing was, business for him for sure. <laughs> and, and you're right. The way the media played, it would be very different if it was today. Mm-hmm. Because you see all these like rap groups, and they have no problem having the whoever associated with them. And oh, you going to be the one to blow up? Cool, I'm getting more of the money than you do. I, I my ego's in check. I'll have my turn next summer. Right. You know what I mean, I'd rather make yeah. that money. Some people, yeah. but you know, I mean, but I get what Prince had. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, also, I mean, Prince, you know, was just. Uh, I don't think it was ever really about the money to Prince. Mm. You know, I I think that it had more to do with uh, ego. Yes, I think it was more. The whole the situation was driven more by by you know, not only ego, but I'd say also. I mean, he you know he needed to show the world something. You know, and so optics were important. <laughs> True, I, I dig it. 
I'm not, I wonder, I'm not, is, I, there, is there anything in there in terms of there can only be one of us on top mentality? Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> uh, well, um, well, uh, all right. I mean, could be. You know, I mean, one time I had a conversation with Jerome and he he seemed to be under the impression that Prince's biggest Achilles heel was the fact that he wanted to control things. He wanted to control people. Mm. Like that was really kind of, you know, and often I, you know, in, in certain circles, you know, I might say jokingly that, you know, that uh, you know, we're just out here making the Kool-Aid, man, you know, <laughs> you know or, or drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, you know, hmm. but uh, because sometimes it felt like you were in a cult. We, we, you know, we we were we were worked to the point of exhaustion, got very little natural sunlight. You know, sometimes I'd I'd be headed home after being at Paisley for maybe you know eighteen hours, and on the way home, get Paige to come uh, texted to come right back. You know, or uh, um, uh, what's the Paige? Yeah, I had a pager on. I'd get to like the first stoplight on on Highway Five, and it'd start buzzing. We'd come right back, <laughs> and and that come right back. That is because Prince just had some a epiphany of like an idea or something, and he needed you to come back to, at that moment. Maybe sometimes I I would would go there. You know, I get called in at like three in the morning, four. You know, with rehearsal happening the next day at eleven. But wow. you no, know, okay. And I get in the car. Somebody drive me out there. Sometimes it was something. Sometimes he was just eating popcorn, you know, in Studio A, watching Last Tango in Paris, you know, and <laughs> wow. just wanted to talk, you know. Oh, and then we talk, and then he go, "We're not going to do nothing. I'll see a rehearsal." Okay, and I go back home. <laughs> now that let's stop for there for a second. Imagine having sort of the the mindset that that's how you live. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure you were not the only one that he was doing this to. But the, it just fascinates me that that's the space that he was in. Like, none of this time mattered. Almost nobody else's time mattered. If this is what I want to do right at this particular moment, I can just do it. And I choose to do it. Even if that means have that man come back here at 3 a.m. No, I know oh, yeah. he's going to be back here tomorrow at work and I'm going to be mm -hmm. on his ass. But damn that. I want to eat some popcorn and watch this movie with his brother and, and talk. That's an interesting sort of... I don't know if we'll ever get Prince like that's cause who Who else gets to live that type of life? Oh, oh well, I mean... Uh, and indulges in it. That's the big choice. Like, he could have chose... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He could have chose to say... No, I'm not going to do that to him. Though I have the power. To, he chose to say, no, call him back. And now this all leads back to the reason why I said, Dean, when we going to talk again? Because <laughs> that person who was saying that, well, Prince, everybody makes mistakes. I'm like, that's uh, not a mistake. Right, right, right. I'm like, yeah, people do. But when you intentionally set out to, you know, <laughs> yeah. to, to, to get people to do things that, Maybe for your benefit, or and maybe for their detriment. That's not a mistake. Mm, a choice. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's, but uh, that's, that's a fascinating side of Prince, though, man. It's like I don't know. People well, talk but, about that a lot. Uh, well, because it's. Uh, I mean, for those of us who willfully went in, we knew what it was about. And you, yeah. you willfully agree to this. Just at its core, because this is one of the greatest artists, musicians. I'm in a great thing, or like, is that the, just the core of it, or why? Why? Why do you make the choice to go along with that type of stuff? Oh, because you, you know, you're uh, you're doing something other people think is important. Mm -hmm. You know, you're 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 in a uh, in a position that most people will never be able to be. Like you're having experiences with somebody that somebody would would kill somebody to try to <laughs> be in your place. So you you covered your own position mm. is what happens. Is that what ended up happening to me? I could have done the hard thing. I could have I could have quit after the new tour and moved to Los Angeles. I you know 
I had a lot of money in the bank and I was only like 20, you know, I had heard, actually, I'm telling you a true story now and I'm not sure, stop me if I've told you this before, but um, I got home and somebody I knew out in California said that Stevie Wonder was starting auditions. Steve was putting together a new band. I think you did mention this, but say okay. it again. Say it again. Yeah. And um, so I thought to myself, wow, I, maybe I should go out to Los Angeles and try this, you know? So I was thinking about it, and I um, I mentioned it to somebody. And I still think that somebody, whoever I told it to, told it to Bobby Z. Because the, the next time I saw him, he was like, hey, man, how's it going? You know, how's, how, you know, how's the gig treating you? And I said, actually, Bobby, I'm, I'm thinking about you know, doing something else. I think I've seen you know, what this gig is. I stayed long enough to show Prince that I can handle it. And that's all I really, uh, maybe that's all I really need is for him to know that I can do it. But maybe I'm choosing to not, you know? And uh, Bobby was like, listen, I know it's, he can be difficult to work with, but if you were ever in a war and you were a soldier, <laughs> Prince would be the best general, you know, you ever had. Like he he knows how to strategize, he knows how to win. He 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 is so uh uh obsessed with victory that you can't lose. You know, more or less. Obsessed with victory. Sure. Not obsessed with victory. That's not what he said, but he's something a, a tantamount to that. Just like it's he's nobody's gonna work harder and and, and you know no nobody's gonna uh accomplish the same things. Not really. Mm. Like he's Prince is a, a he's I wouldn't want to say uh, an anomaly, but almost <laughs> <laughs> You know, now even more than that. Yeah. Yeah. So he was just like, it's a valuable position to be in. You know, a lot of people would love to take your place, you know, but you and him have something, you know. And I, I wouldn't be so quick to, uh, you know, to just walk away from that. And uh, the, the, the next I heard on the subject was, was Prince's voice himself. I think that Bobby told Prince. And Prince and I had a, a conversation on on the phone because it had been a few weeks since, uh, maybe about a month and a half since the new tour had finished. So I was like, I, I, you know, I had time to think. I'm like, this dude likes to talk to me in a tone that I don't really appreciate sometimes. You know, uh, a, a lot of the the, um, I mean, you can't really make any kind of personal plans. Like, you can't really have a life here. You know. Mm. And uh, I, so I thought, thought for myself, I might choose something different. But uh, I don't regret staying. I don't, I don't regret staying. As a matter of fact, it's funny because uh, one of the first gigs I did with an American artist after, uh, after we were all let go was with Maxwell. Oh, that's right. And uh, that goes back as far as, like, 97. We were supposed to tour that year, but then it got canceled. Um. But um, within the first two days of rehearsal, any of the crew members that I knew, like from Minneapolis, because uh, Scotty Baldwin was uh, Maxwell's front of house engineer at the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a mutual friend of ours named Cody Anderson was the monitor guy. Uh, Magoo came out to drum tech for me. And uh, Icky James was uh, uh, Gmo's guitar tech. So there was a, a a good number of the you know, Minneapolis people out there, and people that we knew. Alan Leeds was the tour manager. So uh, by like lunchtime, the second day of rehearsal, almost all of them, except for Alan, came up to me and said, "So you're bored already?" <laughs> uh, and I said, "What do you mean?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to make sure that they were saying what I thought they were saying. Like, dude, I know you. I can see it on your face that this is going to be, you know, this this is going to be like this. This is a gig that that you that you need, but maybe you don't want. Mm. You know, like I needed to work. You know, 
Uh, and I guess I don't know if uh, to them they had seen me in in you know both modes before, <laughs> like like when I was really into it and when I maybe wasn't so much. But they all accused me of like having this. I got thank you. You're looking a little bored back there. You're, you're a little bored. Wow. They're like, well, consider where we came from. You know, it's like we're talking about a dude who had such a short attention span that he would change the set, you know, as we were walking out to the, you know, <laughs> to get on stage. Like, you talk about somebody who was always trying to, you know, trying to, trying to shake things up, you know? So going back to just like a show that's like, excuse me, set, cut and dried. It's like, well, what's there to get excited about? Really? Mm. You know, now I, I don't want to give the impression that I didn't enjoy myself. Uh, I liked working for Maxwell. I, I I specifically liked working with his um, his musical director, Daryl Diaz. Daryl was great. Daryl hated my guts until because <laughs> the drummer that was there before, they were friends like from college or something. Mm. So I moved into a band that was already put together. And Daryl was the uh, musical director. He's a keyboard player. And I think he probably thought that Maxwell was just like, oh, yeah, that dude used to play for Prince. Yeah, I want him in here. And that right. maybe, you know, it would present either a power struggle or, mm. you know, a like I'm like maybe I was there, to, you know, uh, maybe my being there would, would have been trouble. But, um, yeah, it, it, he uh but like for the first week, he hardly looked at me. He just sit behind the keyboard with his arms crossed. You know, <laughs> we were often the first two like there for a rehearsal, and I get there and he'd be he have his arms folded, standing or you know sitting in front of the keyboard, and they say uh, keys, and he'd start playing some of Maxwell's music. Like he didn't, he never played one note that wasn't related to the gig. And I was like, okay, this is a dude who has real discipline. He's not one of those musicians that just plays to play. He plays with purpose. Like, so I had already decided I liked him, but he hated my guts. <laughs> and then one day we start talking. And then we discover we got the same birthday. We're the same age, same birthday. And after that, everything was <laughs> everything was perfectly cool. That was probably what he he was feeling but didn't know it you know what i mean mm -hmm. like he didn't understand something yeah uh, and i was just like well okay this dude is he's pretty much the same way i am like i pick up the sticks when it's time to say something i'm not gonna just make noise all day because i got sticks in my hand and some musicians are like that they're fidgety they want to keep mm -hmm. playing mm -hmm. and what they don't realize is that inter that interrupts you know, when people are trying to talk things over or trying to actually work on stuff, you know, like you're making noise, you know. It seems like guitar players be doing that. Like, Yeah, guitar players, bass players, yeah, keyboard. It can be anybody. It's, you know, it's, um, and I have a firm uh, uh, theory that musicians play as they are. Like, if you're more concerned with your inner dialogue, then that's what happens. Like if you, a, a person who um, who like plays over everybody else is is likely to talk over everybody else in a conversation. <laughs> like so far, I, it's it seems to be true that it has something to do with the personality of the person uh, holding the instrument or playing the instrument. Hmm. You know, if if you're a if if you're thoughtful and you're interested in what everybody else has to say, then. That's how you play. You play, you like, you make room for other people to, to communicate. That's what I do, or that's what I try to do as a musician. Like, I'm trying to set the music up to be something better than what it is right then and there. What I'm, my job to, is to support what's happening, you know, and to kind of push it along. Like, okay, here, you know, play enough to let people know what's coming next, but it ain't really about me or what, you know. It's not about drumming. It's about music. So, you know. Okay. okay. That's just me. Dropping some but, um, theory on us. A little, no, a little, no, just, I mean, I'm just saying. That's that's a bit. that's how I am. That's how Daryl Diaz was. And, you know, that those are the type of people I like to work with. It's like, well, let's, if you're going to play, invest it in the scenario that you're in. Don't just mm. 
do it to clear your mind because that's noise pollution for everybody else. <laughs> okay. Anyway. You, you mentioned something when you were talking about the Maxwell band. Uh, you said power struggle. Oh, and, I'm and, just you know, sorry. Go ahead. Well, and I wanted to ask you going to the Prince's bands, and you were with uh, I don't know how you guys call it. There's the new tour band, and then there's the NPG, or is the NPG the new tour band? Or but ah, uh, wow. I, I mean, I don't even know if that's even a question, but I don't think so. I think that the NPG is 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 a it's a byproduct of the new tour band, but it's not the new tour band. Okay. It's it's not Tommy and Sonny yet. It's not it's Rosie and Tony Damon and Kirk, but you know it's Le Levi on bass is different than Levi on guitar. Okay, okay, I think, uh, and he's just as bad on either. Um, but Levi playing with Miko that was a certain kind of lock. That was a thing they had been developing since since being in Oakland. You know they had played together, so. They had a, a like a synergy. It's like all I had to do was just fall in, you know. I mean, it was Fink <laughs> who had been there since the beginning, you know, and, and Levi and Miko, and uh, okay. you know Rosie. You know, she played some. She sang, you know, but it was. Uh, I don't think they're the same band, really. Okay, but again, consider my position. It's you know. Well, with that said, um, I was going to ask you: Is there was there power struggles in these various bands? And even more, a bigger question I wanted to ask you: One is the concept of there is there a voice of the band? Other than that, sometimes that voice of the band could be the lead guy. In this case, maybe it was Prince, but. It sounds like sometimes it was like the band was a separate thing from Prince or something. And so in the band, what was who was the band member? Like if there was a or issue or a question that the band all wanted to ask Prince, but some people didn't have the nerve to say. Was it that one person that was always elected to you you tell him, you speak well, for the rest of them. Levi. Levi was was our, our musical director. Okay. And I'd say after he left, it it I I mean, I felt like it was me. Okay. It was me during a... But you know what? Morris Hayes was a lot more... Uh, he was a lot more friendly with Prince. Mm -hmm. You know? And I think he was... He was... Um, he was he actually fostered a lot of that communication. I think on the musical direction side of it, it, it may have been me. And uh, also... I started doing a lot of interviews, like I instead of Prince. Like they call looking for him, and he'd tell them, "Tell him to talk to Michael." Hmm. So, I remember one very <laughs> specific interview I gave, <laughs> and they were asking. I can't remember what record had just come out, um, but um, I, I I knew for a fact that Prince was upset about where it charted, but. I also knew what I was supposed to say about it if it came up. <laughs> not because nobody, any, not not because anyone told me, but it just you there long enough, you understand. Like sometimes you're just saying what you need to say. Mm. Um, and uh, the dudes asked, like, oh, "Well, you know, how does Prince feel about this record? Not, you know, not charting as well as the last one." And I said something to the effect of, like. If, if you think a musical genius like Prince has time to sit back and read Billboard, you know, and equivocate over chart position, you're crazy. Um, we're, we're too busy, you know, making music and and anyone else's opinion comes last anyway. You know, it's like what makes you think Prince got, has time to sit around and, you know. Like we we do what we do. You you guys do what you do, and we do what we do. And you know, but I knew <laughs> Prince was hot. <laughs> he was mad. <laughs> wow, which album? You don't remember which album this was? I I can't remember. It might it might have been um, it might have been Come. Okay. Which is a uh, is an interesting work all all the way around. <laughs> Was was it supposed to be like come and then like the gold experience is supposed to come right after that or something? 
Yeah, remember. there was a point in time when we, when we had all the music recorded, but we didn't know which songs were going on which record. Mm. And then in, in the middle of all that, you get the most beautiful girl in the world phenomenon, which uh, emboldened Prince, you know, but Warner Brothers was like, well, yeah, okay, that's great. You had so much success on your own, but... If you slow pitched a ballad to us too, with that kind of pop potential, we could have made it happen. Like that ain't nothing, <laughs> you know. Like give us something we can work with. We could do the same. So, and you guys, as, uh, Exodus, yeah, Exodus was supposed to have come out in America at one point, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but um, yeah, it was it was uh it was an interesting ride. You know, I, I it's uh, some of the details are difficult to recall, like in terms of their uh, sequence. You know, okay. but um, yeah, it, it, Exodus came out um, like that was maybe the the last business transaction we actually had with Prince was over the release of uh, Exodus, and um, uh, we signed some sort of a, a agreement. And we, you know, we got, we got a uh, some decent checks out of it, and then the next thing we knew, <laughs> we were out. So, I I think that he had already made up his mind that he was going to do something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, did you got another one, Big Sexy? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And and Mike, this may be a little out of your uh your field of expertise listening wise and if it's if it is I apologize. Um bass players. If Sonny is a supernova all unto himself, so I am not even gonna bring him up. But Rhonda or Ida? Wow. <laughs> you know, I played with both and they're both great. I don't know I've worked with Rhonda under different circumstances though. Um, like she actually recommended me for a couple of sessions that went down in Los Angeles that was, she was doing for somebody else. So that was, a, you know, I was, I'm forever in her debt for doing that. She didn't have to do that. There's a lot of great drummers in, in, in LA, but, um, you know, I guess she wanted to work with me is all I can, could think of it. But, uh, I think she's great. She's a, 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 a tremendous person. Um, and, uh, I I I think her thing is a little bit more smooth. Ida's a little more aggressive. And uh I don't dislike that, you know, but um I, I got a real sense of Rhonda's identity as a player just because I had more time to spend with her. Um I only played with Ida on the uh, the XL tribute um here in, in St. Paul. Um I think we ended up being paired on something. I want to say, maybe we maybe we did something at Soundcheck. I got to play with her for a hot minute, and she's strong with it. I like I dig it, but I mean, just I think Rhonda got like it's a it's a different kind of kind of, different kind of funk. It's, it's something that I'm I'm more familiar with. All right, cool. Yeah. All right, I got two more. Then <laughs> All right. All, All right. right. <laughs> Here, here's and so here, here's these are these are newer guys. So I'm just curious what you think, uh, D'Angelo or Bruno Mars? Oh, D'Angelo for sure. <laughs> Do I have to explain? Not really, but go ahead. <laughs> I, mean, I don't even know what how would what it just. I, I I prefer my folk uncut. <laughs> I dig it. <laughs> I, I pair I pair them together, and I'm you know I'm sort of including the, the newer Silk Sonic stuff, and I am I will admittedly say I am a fan of both of them, more of okay. a D'Angelo guy because that's my real shit. But the newer Bruno stuff I like it. But well, I've, I, mean, I was going to say real, but I find both of them to be the same in the sense that I think they are both super fans of music that they both. Uh, uh, like to me, a lot of D'Angelo stuff is his interpretation of his covers 
or he's really trying to emulate a style that he likes or different styles. The same way I think Bruno does the same thing now. He loves that type of music. So he emulates the stuff that he's really into because I think he really listens to stuff like that. The only thing I had for both of them is I wish they had enough body of work of their own true uh, musical selves than so much wearing the things that they love so much on their sleeve. And I think they both do that. That's why. Some artists are like that. I get it. I just feel like it's it's closer to the source with D. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, if I hadn't seen Bruno dressed up as Elvis and all that, I, I might feel different. <laughs> but uh, and definitely I might feel different if he had not done what he did on the Grammys. Uh, like I, I didn't I didn't care for that. You know, what, what was that? Uh, the 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 I was at the Prince, Prince thing. Oh, okay. tribute yeah. 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 like uh, dude. I mean, I, I you know, that was a little too close for comfort for me. Right, I get it. Uh, but um, I'm not disputing his talent. Uh, and if you're gonna steal, steal from the best. Why not? Right. You know. Uh, but I guess I just feel like uh, artistically, I get it. I understand what you're saying. Some people are like that. They they make music like the music they like. It's not necessarily a refle- uh, reflection of their their themselves artistically. Yeah. Like you they're know, really it's, good, mm-hmm. but it's almost like there's there's great cover bands that are some dope musicians in here. But I'd be really curious to hear their like what would they come up with? And I and I'd say the same with with Bruno. Like like I hope one day he's okay. I hope I'm successful. I can just make whatever the fuck I really sound like. And it may sound nothing like this him covers his cover music or even the pop stuff he had earlier but i would love to hear his like true artistic work as opposed to this very sort of you know i'm not gonna say plastic but I you, got you. You, you, you know what i mean it's just uh-huh. i mean yeah. he was a ghostwriter before though wasn't he right what well, uh, so i mean you yeah. may have heard like I, I what i understood was that before he signed like whatever kind of record deal he had he was he was a writer. Like, he wrote hits for other people. Right. Yeah, he did. Yes. So, when you come from that sort of thing, a lot more of it is academic. Yeah. All right. I think. If 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 you've taken on the job of writing music for other people, it kind of means you have to leave your personality out of it. And sort of adapt theirs. And- well, not only adapt theirs, but adapt to whatever is going on in popular culture at the time. Right. Okay. You know? So, I think that... Uh, it's interesting that, you know, I, he got, I think that some of that, you know, like grenade and all that, uh, I, I feel like those, those are, you know, I don't feel that that work is as derivative. You see, and I hated those songs. And I never well, okay. paid. Well, I, and I never paid. Maybe you wouldn't like Bruno in well, the raw. <laughs> that's why I, I, I thought he was a joke. Like I, I didn't say it was a joke. I just, I was like, this is some pop dude. I don't listen to this. <laughs> and I knew what it was. But what it was is funny. Is me and my partner Tobias, we went to Minneapolis during the piano on the mic, and and he's a musician that I trust and I know him. And he's like, do you listen to the Bruno? I was like, man, stop, stop playing. We don't, we don't listen to that. He's like, nah, man. I'm not talking about them songs you hear in the radio. Listen to some of the shit on the album. He, he was like, he's kind of cold. And I was like, whatever. He played me something. I was like, I can see why you were kind of saying that. And this was like, uh, this was before the, where he turned it, you know, where he turned to flip the sound over. It was before he had those Uptown Funk and all that. And I was like, okay. Yeah, I can 24 see Karat. Yeah, I was like, that. I yeah, can yeah. kind of see what you're saying. And so then when he does come with those songs, I was like, oh, my homeboy was kind of trying to put me up on it. So I can hear the talent in him. He can sing, but mm-hmm. like I said, uh, yeah, you want to you want to see who, who is he really, right? You know, and then but, with D'Angelo, it's like you hear the fucking grit and it's just, but it's like, man, I wish he could put out more material. Like, yeah, know. that's Southern Church, and I, you know, I, I, uh, you know, there's no, you can't fake that. No. That's right. that 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 hog grit that he got. <laughs> That's 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 authentic. I guess that's what I don't hear in Bruno, and I think oh, no, Bruno's no, a, a tremendous singer. You know, he, he could he could leave the guitar alone, as far as I'm concerned. Don't 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 bother with that. You know, unless unless you're going to stop bending sharp, then you know 
you know, or get a thicker gauge of string and, and practice. But, you know. Well, he's an instant it, star, so that's why. That, instant star, yes. But, you know, you That'd be a good name for a band. <laughs> it would be. Very satirical instant star, instant star. But, yeah um, um you know and of course you uh, if you were an aficionado of music as like michael dean then how are you not going to like silk sonic because that's straight up philly it just feels good in today's world like mm -hmm. you're so star like yeah. this is kind of yeah. new it sounds like that sounds like buttered pop you know buttered biscuits sure. oh, yeah yeah, I mean, the, you know, the stylistics, the, 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 the chai lights, exactly. the Delphonics, they ain't around no more. So why not, you know, Anderson Pac, on the other hand, I think he's the bomb. He is dope. His last, yeah. I love his last album. Yeah. That's why I like, I was like, that's what I'm saying. It's Silk Sonic because he, to me, Anderson Pac is a more, he's funkier to me than Bruno. Like, I love Alan Anderson Pac. And he's the well, He's nasty on everything. I, yeah. I, I love his drumming. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. But yeah, you know. it's see, a shame a that thing. that's the closest thing. I'm sorry. I'm a, it's a shame that this is kind of all mainstreamness, I should say, that we have a music like this, though. So that's the good thing about um, a collaboration like that. It exposes people to new things because I knew nothing of Anderson Park before Silk Sonic. I mean, I, I knew the name, but I didn't know his, his catalog. Oh, I think that's and so that got me looking yeah. into his catalog. So it's always a good thing. I, I hate sure. to I hate to do this, so I always do this. But the way that they these two artists came together and did a project like that and seems to be being taken very well. Could there could there have been maybe there could have never been, but would how powerful it would have been if it was a if a Michael and Prince Soul Sonic type <laughs> of project, you know? Um. Wow. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that um that if it didn't work, it would be on Prince. Interesting. Uh just because Michael Jackson did so much collaborative work That's in, in his career. He That's sang true. backgrounds on like uh like minute by minute by the Doobie right. brothers. Like <laughs> he did? He yes. Did. Whoa. Like he he would, you know, he'd do like he'd sing backgrounds on like hit records that we all know and love. Does it feel like somebody's well, yeah, That's the most obvious example. But, I mean there's <laughs> there's a lot. There's there's a lot of songs that he ended up singing on. You know? Um so I think that he his process maybe was a little bit more open. Like he's a little, he's a little more the, the type of person who likes to collaborate. I uh, I don't, I think Prince, you know, 50, 50, like, I think he um, was very driven by his own vision and uh, kind of, he's going to take things where he thinks they should go. And if, uh, if the result is unsuccessful in his eyes, he'll just kind of shrug it off and keep moving. Yeah, I, that's that's what I think, and I only say that um, because I know that there's a remix of a song by Stevie Wonder called "Cold Chill," and I remember being at Paisley the day that Stevie Wonder showed up to work on it with Prince. And uh, oh, actually, no, they worked on something else that day, but then he had his people send Prince the masters to this song "Cold Chill," and. Uh, Man, I think it might be on YouTube somewhere, like Prince's version, like Prince's remix of Cold Chill. It's incredible. And Stevie was like, nope, <laughs> I ain't putting it out. Wow. I think Stevie and Prince are more similar than Prince and Michael Jackson. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I think that Stevie was like, mm. like what you, what, what, you, what you trying to do to my music? You know? <laughs> But I mean, it's it sounds like a Prince track. <laughs> he, he, he just, you know, he turned it on, man. I, you should you should check it out. It's pretty out. incredible. I remember I, I remember having lunch with um, Nate Watts, who played bass with Stevie when he was like 16, 17. Like he was in like when Greg Fellingaines was in. Like they were playing with Stevie. It's supposed to be in high school and whatnot. Wow. Um, and. Uh, 
we had lunch actually at the New Power Generation store in Camden, in England. Uh, and again, I, I love to compare stories with other people who work with iconic, you know, musicians. And um, you know, his his experience with Stevie was kind of like my experience with with Prince in terms of like day night. It don't matter, and especially to Stevie because Stevie blind, he don't care. <laughs> There's just time going by. He's like Stevie was, you know, they would tell him to be at the studio at seven in the evening, and Stevie wouldn't get there till three thirty in the morning. You know, it's just kind of a, a a a part of when you're working with musical people of that magnitude. Mm. You kind of understand going in that it's going to be about what they want to do and when, mm. and it's not going to be any other way. It's not a normal life. It's like being a fireman. Like that's not normal. You just sit in perpetuity waiting for something to happen. You know, and then when it does, you better be ready. You know, wow. That ain't, and it's not the, it, that life don't work for everybody. You Who, know, who's the artist like that today? Like the super artistic about their music, their oh, life wow. is dedicated to it. I'm, there's really only one person I can think of that's like that and is prolific. And y'all not gonna like what I'm about to say. I don't care who is it, Kanye. Oh, I know, it's I knew it. <laughs> oh, look, I got no beef with Kanye. Oh, okay. Nah, man, I, I I like for him to take his meds and whatnot, <laughs> but but he's the crazy man, I, artist. That's what I'm saying. Like that's he is the actual the the, the loony you know you know the loony mm -hmm. artist, very prolific, artistic, eccentric. Cent, eccent, you know, he's got all the he's he is that one mm -hmm. now. It's a rapper that is that guy now. Yeah, he's the I do what I want guy now. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it. You know, he, he's 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 been in the game. Way mm -hmm. longer than probably most people would ever get to be at this point. You think yeah. about when he really came out, he's and he's still top of mind. Yeah, you know I, what listen, I mean. Like that's a I, very rare position. I don't hate Kanye. I, you know, I don't understand him all the time, but I, I I do think that the art comes first with him. Yeah, and that's that's always all right with me. I mean, even if I don't buy the records, I'm still down. Like, hey, do your thing, man. I mean, uh, I used somebody asked me about Fishbone one time. I'm like, well, I, how I feel about it is, you know, by the time they got to like Chim Chim's Badass Revenge, I was like, I can't listen to your records no more. But I, 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 I'm in your corner. Do your thing. It just, it ain't my thing no more. Right. The respect, the, the artistic respect is there. It's like I. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I mean, before. Well, I mean, the only. The, well. Kanye may, may be the last man standing, but I mean, you know, really, I guess, well, David Bowie died before Prince. So it was like, whoa, well, yeah. Yeah. those, uh, you know, I guess. But but even Prince and David Bowie, and I'm going to say this with the utmost <laughs> respect. If you were to go at their time, pro probably as, long, as many years as Kanye has been active and he's still the kind of in a one number one, number two position. In terms of thought leader to the culture, I don't, oh, I don't know if sure. those artists are, have that effect. That's you know fair. I mean? That's fair to say. Kanye still has has an effect on the culture. Yeah, I agree with that, man. That he people might hate him, but they still listen when he opens his mouth. Yeah, like he's and after all this time, mm -hmm. you know, not too many artists well, have that kind of. Well, he has that luxury because maybe because he's not, you know, a typical sort of musician. He's a. Yeah. Uh, Kanye is a bit more like, not an archivist, but, you know, like, uh, I think that Kanye is like, like a really, like a, like a really good rapper, and, but kind of also like, he's got this sort of exceptional DJ mindset. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like he picks the rare cuts that it's like, you gotta, you have to have been somewhere. Right. To to know to grab "Say You Love Me" by DJ Rogers. He's a music lover, and put Big Sean with it. Yeah, yeah. But I don't give up that. When I heard that "Say," like man, that shook me to my core. DJ Rogers is maybe the coldest in 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 of all time to me. You know, 
And for Kanye to give him a nod like that and also pay that old man a little money in his, you know, in his later later years. Right. I mean, I, I was like, okay, Kanye, I, I'm down with you, man. He, in my opinion, he is those things you're talking about, the archivist and stuff. He is uh, hip hop's interpretation and in, and in, in almost like sponging and surrounding the previous culture that came before it. So yeah. he is the Andy Warhol. He is Run DMC. He is Tupac. Uh-huh. He's he, you know he is uh, John Lennon. With the Yoko, I mean, he's so yeah. he's all of that, but he's through hip hop's lens of yeah, mixing he's, he's, and sampling and reconstructing. He's, yes, and, he's the curator. Yeah, he's the curator, and he understands antics, and how, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. And I can say some outlandish shit, you know, such and such doesn't care about black people, or he'll slavery is <laughs> a choice. You know, he <laughs> understands the entire gamut of how to play the culture because he's studied it. And mm-hmm. he's his he even when he doesn't have a record, just his activity is the performance, and he knows that. Like I think he plays, even when he's playing crazy. I mean, it's I, all performance. I say he's playing. Yeah, I think he's this whole it's thing all is performance. performance. Yes, I, I I don't disagree. I don't know how much mental illness may play a part, but you know, I you know, I guess I'll I'll it, it end this conversation where I started it. That it, we're all on some kind of spectrum. <laughs> okay. So you know, I I say for myself, I know that I'm somewhere on it, because it just uh, a lot of things in life don't make the right kind of sense to me, and I know that what I'm doing through art is is uh, attempting to create what I think is missing in the world. Mm. Okay. You know, even if, if it's just a simple drum track I played on somebody's record. If if I'm gonna touch the sticks, it's serious business. I'm trying to touch the golden chalice. Mm, okay. It doesn't matter for who. I love it. I like I that. It. I love it, yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna steal that. <laughs> I don't know what I just said, but all right, you can no, do that. You, you dropped that on us. One last thing and we're all right. out of here. One last thing. <laughs> what do you where do you want to see? Princess Legacy. What do I want to see? What would you want to see out of Princess Legacy? What do you want to see? Oh, be? wow. You know what? I think that um, I, I'm not familiar with everything that's been done. And I know that there's things like uh, like Heidi Vader has the Purple Playground. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did like an interview or some sort of uh, online like meeting with like some of those, some of the students she's got, and they're you know they're around the world, um, and so she's you know in her own way trying to protect Princess Legacy and trying to promote you know playing instruments to to to, to youth you know, and uh, getting them to you know write and to you know just be involved in the arts. Um, I think I would like to see that on a grander scale. I remember Prince saying one day <laughs> in a. In Studio A, he's something along the line. Well, listen, I don't have to do this. I could go start teaching at the U of M. I could funk one hundred and one. <laughs> <laughs> I could, I could just, I could retire and you know, get on the lecture circuit and just talk about. I, that would satisfy me. I don't have to do this. Interesting. You know, it, it, and and I really think that um, people don't understand. Uh, it's hard to understand how good Prince really was, you know, it's like, sure. Some people, you know, get off on, you know, the, the, the more body aspects of it or the, oh, that he got away with this or that, but you're talking about somebody who was uh, in deep study. Mm-hmm. Like um, one of the things I used to like to do is he'd leave like one of the studios and go somewhere or he, maybe he had, we would have gone home and I was still there for some reason. I would always check the tray uh, of the CD player to see what he had been listening to. And it was, it, it, man, it was all sorts of things. I mean, it, it, it could be classical. It could be some kind of world beat music. It could be jazz. It could be rock and roll. It could be anything, man, really. Like he was always keeping his ears open. And, uh, 
Uh, I think that um, he was a real student of music. A lot of superstars are not. Mm. And uh, I said to someone uh, 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 about the time that uh, I recorded with George Benton in Studio B at Paisley Park. It was like 95. And Prince stepped in the control room to get his guitar signed by George Benton. And he looked up and he saw me behind the drums out in the performance area. And he ice grilled me, man. <laughs> what are you doing in here cutting with George Benson? And that's how it kind of came out. Why is that so funny to you, man? I'm just picturing that. <laughs> yeah, he was, George was signing the guitar and he happened to look up and he looked out the window, you know. And I was out there sitting behind the drums and he just, man. <laughs> I can't he take y'all like, nowhere. Well, yeah, not just that, but it's like, I, later on I thought about it and it's like, what if you were Prince? What if you still wanted to, you know, just play music, just enjoy yourself and share ideas and just play with good good players and just like have the experience? Like, he, can, he couldn't do that. He couldn't just be the side man on somebody else's session. Like it's too, too too much at stake. This is Prince. This is it's, that's a that's a lot, you know. And sometimes he just wanted to be a fly on the wall or just one of the other dudes. That's why he'd come down and sit in at bunkers. He never came down there to like solo. I don't know if he ever touched the the, the distortion pedal ever. He sit sit in the corner quietly and just funk along. That's all he really wanted to do, hmm. you know. But I think that being a superstar, you can't do that. You can't, you know. And I think he may have, uh, I don't want to say envied the fact that I was able to continue to do that, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it didn't make him happy to see that. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm in the studio with one of his idols in his building. <laughs> so, you know, he had to feel some kind of way, but I don't think it was really like, uh, you know, uh, I don't think it, was, it had to do with like, uh, anything territorial, like you're not supposed to be playing with anybody else, but it was more like, like I, I, he was like envious. Like he probably would love nothing more than to sit down with George Benson and just, you know, <laughs> just riff, just learn things and talk and, you know. Just vibe, man. Yeah. That but makes he, perfect but, sense. Yeah. He was also, though, he had moments where I think he was, there was always a shy person in Prince, you know. I don't think that he was putting that on. I think he really, you know, I think he was really a, sh a shy person sometimes. And uh, also, like, you know, I guess probably too proud sometimes. Like, maybe he thought he didn't know what that would look like, you know? Hmm. He didn't want anybody, you know, thinking, you know, uh, less of him for for openly seeking knowledge or, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm really, I'm speculating and it's, uh, you know, I'm, no, I don't I know, man, but it's just, that pride. You know, it's a, it's yeah. It's with. like, well, yeah, well, I'm Prince. It's, it's not like I'm nobody. He's George Benson, but I'm, I, you know, right. He's cutting in my building. <laughs> this is, this is my, you know, my, my environment. So you might've been too proud. Some of us be like that. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's like, I, man, listen, I, uh, knowledge is free as far as I'm concerned, you know, and I learn something every time I, every time I work with any musician, I learn something. So. Well, we all learn something here at this conversation. Well, hold on, Mike. Hold uh -oh. on. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, Mike, I don't, I mean, we've been here for a minute and I don't want to just bogart anymore. You're talking about, I got one more question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, in light of his passing, stories like that that you mentioned have been coming out. There's one great story with Billy Gibbons talking about meeting Prince and Dave Grohl, you know, got to play with him just in the empty building and just loved it. So I, so I definitely dig that and I'm, and I'm glad, you know, people get to see that. Now, having said that, you mentioned Jimmy Jam earlier, a personal hero of mine. And Jimmy, you're going to come on the show at some point, man. Just deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> He said something really flattering, and I, I, of course, think the world of him. And he and he spoke very highly of Billie Eilish. And I thought, you know what? Let me, you know, don't be that guy. Let me take a listen. And the production, outstanding. But I got to tell you, man, maybe it's not aimed at me because the voice. I'm just not getting it. Am I missing something here? Um, 
you are if you don't see her live. Like if you ah, don't see footage of her live. Okay. I, I really believe that she's that good of a singer. Like I'm talking about like technically. Like she has really strong intonation. And uh some there's something about her voice. The first time I heard it, I I, I had to stop for a minute. So I, I would say that. Um but uh Again, it's like I'm I'm not I'm just not down with dark energy, man. I just, you know <laughs> I'm not the one. I, I you know, I I'm 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 here to do God's work the best that I know how. I don't like to flirt with, with the darkness, you know. And and in whatever way I did, I I, I you know <laughs> the, that 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 is a uh uh that that I, I was in in I was as close in proximity to it as I ever want to be in life during some of my time <laughs> uh, that we that we're speaking of. Yeah. You know, like I I don't really. It's like I get it, I, and I art for art's sake. I, you know, I think that she and her brother managed to pull off something extraordinary. But uh, you know, the thing is, is that uh, I. Uh, <laughs> I know that Phineas had to had to walk back a couple of things because I think they tried to they try it seemed like they were trying to tell the world they did it all by themselves on like Logic Pro. <laughs> you know do you know what Logic Pro is, Big Sexy? I do. Michael Dean, do you know what Big uh, Yes? Sir. What, okay. Yes. They're trying to say they made that whole record on Logic Pro. And, you know, when they really put his feet to the fire, Phineas had to make, you know, well, actually, this and that, and the mastering guy, and uh, well, we had to for this, you know, we had to, you know, he expanded a little bit more on the subject because nobody was re ready to believe that, and you know, it wasn't actually, you know, it wasn't really the truth. So, I think sometimes when people look at it, they they're like, those two kids did this whole thing on their own, but uh, no. Yeah. Uh, That's great marketing. Yeah. I yeah. mean it's a, it's a great notion, but the reality is this. And I'll say this. <laughs> that considering uh even just considering uh other artists of Prince's, you know, genre, anybody you would consider to be his peer, Prince is the only one who you could lock in a studio by himself. And he come out with a hit record. He didn't need anybody, you know. Yeah. Everybody else, they 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 needed a cohort. They needed a you know somebody to kind of advise them or let let them know they were on the right path. You know, there's no way MJ would have been able to do what he did without Quincy. Okay. Once again, <laughs> he and I are here. <laughs> the, no way, Madonna. She needed Nile Rodgers if she was going to really like break through. Prince, when doves cry, <laughs> come on, man. That that's that's one man at the summit of his powers. Mm. Could none of those people could do that, and I don't know that anybody could do that now. Except for I'm not gonna say. Who? <laughs> well, well you can say I, it. again. Maybe I'm maybe I'm missing it's, somebody. It's e well, no, I'm just saying it's it's easy for us to. Well, I'm not talking for you, but we can herald these other people. We got to remember when in their day though, people did not like everything they did. They didn't always hit. And I was gonna say Kanye. I'm not even a fan of his music like that, but oh, I understand okay. that he could come up with some song that would blow. Because he's done that, but well, but the, by me yeah. saying that, some, some people are gonna be like, "Ah, oh, it's not that's sacrilege. He's not in the same level." But no, in no, today's no, no, no. time, to me, he is on the same level. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I, I think that uh, uh, actually a friend of mine who go nameless because I want people finding him on Facebook and blowing up, <laughs> blowing up the spot said that he thought that um uh what's the record? The record with uh is it? What's the song called? I, I'm on a, a laser, a light, light, ultra beam, something. 
See, I don't even know his music like that, so I have no. Kanye, the, the the one that was like my my sad dark. See, I, I didn't listen to fantasy. that album, but I have respect for it. Well, a friend of mine uh, who's a who's a bad dude said that's love sexy. I've heard right people now. say stuff like that. I heard people say stuff like that. He's like that record is just whatever it chooses to be. Like there's a there's so much, uh, like adventure. Yeah. And like like that record for him was like it's like man this is like love sexy and not all princess fans like love sexy right a lot of people thought he was preaching right you know it was like well what get back to you know get back to being dirty prince right. this is this is cute you know but um I, love sexy actually is one of my favorites yeah. and uh, it's funny I remember asking Eric Leeds like man I was like the horns are incredible on love sexy. Like, how did you come up with this part with it? He's like, <laughs> I don't want to put words in Eric's mouth, but he basically told me that none of that horn work was his. That Prince came up with those horn parts and that, let's just say he would have done things differently. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, like, he was someone who was there for the process and didn't like the results. So I've kind of I heard him that say stuff like that before. Well, you know, uh, Eric, I because it. Eric's, yes, but Eric is um, someone who is not necessarily defined by his experience with Prince. Right. I unfortunately really am. <laughs> so he can say some things, mm -hmm. you know, and also he's already let it be broke. So the fans are, you know, whoever has chosen to hate him, they already hate him. <laughs> yeah, he has so, a very, he has a very gentleman's style of a, I don't really give a fuck what you think attitude but it's a very yeah. gentlemanly done <laughs> no he's yeah, yeah let it be known also I, I think Eric is the baddest man walking on horn uh, he's cool. Eric is hands down my favorite I remember the first time I got to meet him I said you don't know how bad I wanted to be in Madhouse when I was in high school <laughs> <laughs> and he's like well we could have used you man wow. <laughs> I was like oh all right, and I'm not gonna name any names oh, going forward, but <laughs> <laughs> but like, then wow, you get okay. to play with them on Madhouse, right? Uh, yeah, I and mean it was guys cut, you know. sure, yes, but uh, it, it I mean it was it, had it been that earlier music, it was a little you know it was a little more like mainstream than what we did, I think, you know. Gotcha. I, I still mean, listen that, to that like very well, often too. Which one? I guess the the twenty four album that you guys cut was wow yeah okay I don't think that was ever officially released it, it, it wasn't but it's out in the streets <laughs> oh, well, okay <laughs> well I mean I think my my favorite of that collection of songs because we cut pretty much all of that the same day really um, yeah that was man that was about five hours in the studio fascinating wow then Prince went back in after on songs like Ass Whoop and like he started he started playing. Like that crunchy like horn patch over some of my fills and whatnot. Like he, that that stuff was an overdub, but that was that was an all day affair, and I was I was upset, man, because we had and we had pulled a, a like a late nighter the night before. Oh wow! And, uh, and by that time, it was like I you know, I, it was it was starting to upset me. So. I was, I guess, I was particularly vicious, like on the first couple, like ass whoop, like I don't know, I just was so talkative, I just had a lot to get off my chest, <laughs> you know. Oh my goodness! But it was. Uh, I'm gonna hear this totally different now. That's fine. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, it, but like, yeah, all, almost everything you hear was done that day. Uh, very, very few overdubs. Uh, um, you know my favorite now I got you, and and this is like it's cheating to me because it's not really Madhousey, but my favorite music on that is uh, Space. I don't know why. It's just like it's just oh, that's right. We cut a version of Space on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I, that was again. It was just an idea that Prince was like, oh, "Why don't we do? Why don't we? Why don't we play Space?" Uh, I don't even know if Eric knew the song so well, but um, you know, wow. yeah. But uh, yeah, that was yes, Eric, hands down my favorite, uh, and I and I'll tell you why. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, a French uh, composer named uh, Michel Colombier, and Michel Colombier actually is the guy who scored Purple Rain. 
Um, oh, like the music you like kind of hear. The, incident, the incidental music. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's Michelle on a Columbia. bootleg, too. I love that. I'll bet it is. Uh. But uh, I asked him, like, well, who is your favorite composer? And he said, uh, Amadeus Mozart. I said, why? He said, because. <laughs> And, I, and I'm hearing something else now as I'm saying it. But he said that uh, Mozart would never exhaust the range of an instrument. He would only write for them in their natural range. He never had, like, any horn that sounded good low playing anything high. Like, he maintained a sort of what he considered to be the natural extension of the instrument. And if he needed something high, he'd switch to a different instrument. That's why sometimes you hear a, a phrase like in the lower register on, on Mozart's music and next you'll hear like a piccolo and, you know, like something up higher. Like he wanted something to happen, but he didn't want this instrument that sounded great in its natural range to overextend itself. Hmm. And I know for a fact that Eric Leeds, uh, when he, at least when he used to practice, he used to read the Charlie Parker uh uh, solo book, like it's a it's a book of transcriptions of Charlie Parker's saxophone solos, and he'd spend every day all day. He might still now spend every day all day forcing his fingers to go somewhere they would not normally go, mm. you know. But Eric plays like that. Eric doesn't play like you know like Sanborn or somebody who you know they you know go all to the high notes for you know dramatic effect and. Mm. <laughs> Scre all that screeching and whatnot. That's not Eric. Eric's he's playing in a straight line and he's having a conversation and he's giving you his take on something very specific and he's not dramatic about it. He is just plainly stated. You know, his time is impeccable. His phrasing is incredible. Um, and uh, I'm not sure where I was, I was headed with that, but I was thinking to myself that maybe... The, the Charlie Parker book has had some influence on that. Mm -hmm. And it would make sense to me that because Charlie Parker was some kind of Mozart himself. You know? Wow. Anyway. It's Eric just Lee's goat. That's all. That's yeah. All. Uh, yeah. You can hate him if you want. Don't hate the plan. Don't uh, hate the player. <laughs> <laughs> hate the game. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> All right. Well, woo, Michael Ooh. Bland, thank you so much, man, for this. This is great. I know people are going to be bugging out here. And you think so? I, oh, I wonder yeah. if we spoke yeah. about it's good things. stuff. No, but it's, it's all, you know. You don't think it's over, not over their heads in like a condescending no, no. way, but I mean, you think this is interesting well, to, any, to anybody? Oh, oh, yeah. Stop playing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> stop. Playing. Are you going to edit it? No. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I mean, there was one part of me that's like, yeah, there's some of these little sections are golden for you know but i'm put this i'm not going to edit what we talked about at all no. all right straight feed all right i, man, I got I you do that. i can respect that i didn't say anything that i feel funny about i just i'm like i you know sometimes i'm just i'm just talking i don't know where i'm going with it and, so. and that was the whole point we were just going to get on here and talk so when we what we started talking about was what was on our minds and we right. shifted around and that's how real conversations work. It was yeah, it was this was a real conversation. <laughs> there you go. See? Yeah. Now the next level of real conversation ain't gonna be uh televised. It'll just be for us. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> it's like I tell you all some things. <laughs> <laughs> but with that said, uh Mr. Bland, where can the people find you online? Oh wow. I mean I I, I just bit the bullet and started an Instagram account. Okay. So I'm there now. You know, it's like I'm also in light of COVID and whatnot. It's like I want to start doing more recording sessions from, from, from my space. You know, we're set up. We got nice, nice microphones. We got, you know, plenty of room. So I've just been taking, you know, session work, you know, just people get at me and you know we negotiate a fee i'll give them a couple of takes one nice. you know kind of down the pipe and one a little more you know ornate or you know more my style and uh you know it's you know i'm not trying to bleed nobody I'm, I'm i'm getting decent flow you know i can always use one more person going hey man could you play on this i'd be like i'm happy to do it you know especially since it's just me and the engineer in a, in a you know a large room yes. and nobody's gonna catch nothing so and how do they you find know. you from your IG page? Or uh, uh, well, I mean, I'm just I, oh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, Michael Bland official. Okay, uh, uh, actually, on YouTube and also on Instagram. So oh, okay, and 
Yeah, a little bit, man. I'm 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 wary of it. I don't really want to. I don't want it running my life, you know. Okay, Neo. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's like you know, and you know, people they know where to find me on Facebook because I'm always running my mouth about something. So, you know, it's uh, I'm just I'm just saying what I feel. But you know, these this in, in this day and age, like right now, I I I, I feel all right, man. Uh, you know, I feel all right uh, about the future, and maybe it's because you know. Uh, I took a lot of cathartic time during this uh, pandemic uh, and figured out some things about myself that I'm not sure I knew before. I, I know who I am as a musician, but what the what the pandemic did was it allowed me to really spend time with myself and try to figure out who I am as a person. You know, I'm so closely, I'm so close and tight knit with music that, I, you know, I, I, I hardly ever stopped to ponder the question, like, who am I becoming? Outside of that, you know, that's, that's, am, am, am I the person that I think I am, right. you know, or, or how much work till I am that if I'm not already, you know, and so a lot of people had had real problems with the isolation and whatnot. For me, it, it did a lot of good. All right. All right. I, I hear that that 52, 53 talking because I'm starting to come into that same mindset. I love it. I, I dig it. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, it's also just, you know. The fact that my sisters were older, I spent a lot of time alone by myself as a kid. So, you know, it's a uh, latchkey generation. A little bit. Actually, yeah. my, my oldest sister was actually one of the uh, one of the aides in, in latchkey at my uh, okay. elementary school. And sometimes she'd come around peeking because I'd be doing after school activities. I'd be in the, uh, you know, in the uh, what do they call it? The pottery room. Like, you know. Making you know ashtrays or whatever, whatever they made you made you make. Sometimes I was just in there creating. I you know, and it's uh it's funny because um uh the one thing she said to me that I'll I'll never forget, and I and I'm grateful for it now, and I took it for granted a lot in my life that I came from a family that loved me unconditionally. And in that latchkey program, there were a lot of kids that were being uh that were just downright neglected. You know, and uh, I mean, a lot of that latchkey is about like families that split up yeah. and who's at home to open the door. Are you there with adult supervision? Right. Like That's a lot for a kid to go through, you know, that's going to be uh, another podcast because I think we can both speak to some personal things on that. But, yeah, that's OK. Listener, go look that up. That's a part of history that, that affects yeah. people today. But yeah, it's um, I'm I'm grateful for that. And you know, while I'm, it's funny. My dad, when I got, I'll just say this, and I'll be done for sure. <laughs> All right, I preach went, it. I meant I, I went almost the entire. I thought about this the other day. I went almost the entire nude tour without calling home. Mm. Like this was 1990. No cell phones. No, you know. Overseas calls were expensive. You know, Prince had us working all day, all night. It never even occurred to me till like the third month I was out. Wow. And my dad was like, well, all we could do was look at the news every day and see if there's any crashes or anything. Mm. You know, you could have called home. Your mother was worried, mm. you know, but I was, <laughs> they didn't know what I was going through. And they didn't have to, you know, but that it was like, I was a whole world that I was just trying and to. And you were 19? Digest and process. Nineteen or twenty, yeah, you was probably twenty. Baby. By the time we went out on the new, uh, yeah, right. I'm out there with dudes who are like 30, right. 30 you know, thirty two, thirty five. You in know, a, in a rock and roll tour. <laughs> yeah, with, with Prince. <laughs> exactly. It's like they, I, I couldn't even explain it. I can't explain it now. How crazy that was. Like the first night. We, you, I mean, you. Was, I know you're familiar with like we opened with the future and then we went into 1999, so on and so forth. I'm playing first night. Paul McCartney's there, uh, like it's, it's the first night at Wembley. Rather, I'm I'm talking about Paul McCartney. That was the first big gig of that tour. Actually, was when we got to London. Um, to me, uh, who else? Uh, the the lights sweep on like the intro of 90, 1999. And I see George Michael jumping up and down like a little girl, clapping his hands <laughs> in the front row. I know that's a mind blow. He's like, I could man, that freaked me out. <laughs> I was like, first off, he's a superstar and he's in the front row. All right. Like, you know, Paul McCartney was there, Kate Bush was there, 
uh, during that run, <laughs> and I'll end on this, Peter Gabriel was sitting on like a, a, a bench outside Prince's dressing room. Uh, he wanted to talk to him. And I walked by him. I was like, oh, hey, man, I'm a big fan. I loved his records from, from the 80s. And I think so was like the last record he had had, had out. That was a big deal, that record, uh, with Sledgehammer and all that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and he was sitting, waiting for Prince. And I passed back by. He was still there. Then the third time I passed, he was gone. And then uh, Joey, uh, Joey Guzman, I think Joey is Sheila's cousin. Joey was doing security for Prince. He was the dude. That, he was the Mexican dude that looked kind of kind of Japanese or Chinese. So nobody would mess with him because they thought he knew kung fu. <laughs> but uh, Joey was actually, I think he was he was a, he was a Golden Gloves boxer, oh. and he was Mexican. They thought he was you know Chinese and a kung fu expert. So he just said, "Hey, you know, uh, we don't." And they okay, no problem, man. You know, Joey didn't have to actually lay hands on nobody. <laughs> stop, stop Asian hate. Uh huh. But yeah, right. But <laughs> he, he, they used to call me Bobby, like Bobby Blue Bland, like him and Dwayne and Gilbert. They, they, because they like, no, your last name is Bland, like Bobby Blue. Bland. Like, but we're gonna call you Bobby. Hilarious. So I hear Bobby. <laughs> Prince want to talk to you, man. So I come down to Prince's dressing room. Prince has got the hot, the hot comb out. He's doing his hair. You know, he's sitting there in front of like his makeup table and whatnot. Hilarious. I remember it was a curling iron. Like, and I don't remember what he asked me uh, uh, about. He's like, tonight when you do this or that, you know, just instead of this, like, I don't get, I don't have enough time. So instead, can you do this here? And then, like, then, like make one of the, the wardrobe changes work better. And I, I say, did you talk to Peter Gabriel? And he starts cracking up. <laughs> he says, about what? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, well, all right then. All right. He don't really care. <laughs> now, on the, on the other hand, I'm in his dressing room. Same, same run at Wembley. Mick Jagger lets himself in. Wow. Just comes walking in. Hello, hello, hello. hello. <laughs> Prince jumps up and, and hugs Mick like, you know, I mean, they are old friends, you know. Mick got the red carpet. So. Right, right. Well, it's funny, Jack, man. man. Yeah, I guess. It's like, <laughs> it was a difference to Prince. <laughs> you said, for what? I can hear. Did he have it like, a, like for what? For what? You're kind of like, for what? Like, <laughs> we don't have anything in common. His records ain't funky. What, 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 what? what you know. Oh, anyway, man. yeah, I don't have anything to talk with him about. I'm not involved in Amnesty International. I don't, you know. And you said, yeah. See, I would have been. I could see that, like in a movie, because the hot comb. <laughs> him with the hot comb it would be like, you're not. We ain't never seen him like this. I would just, I'd be dead at the door. But then, <laughs> listen, just I, be man, like, I, for what? With a hot comb in his hand, I'd be dead. I'd die. That that particular run, I saw him with that hot comb in his hand more than I wanted to. That was also because I didn't know what I was getting called in for sometimes. And sometimes it was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know? Wow. Like, like uh, why are you trying to mess up my show? Like, don't oh. I work hard enough? <laughs> you know? What do I have to do so that you can do what I need you to do Damn. better for me you know sometimes it was that i mean i made my share of mistakes on that tour and that's that was really was the test of not my manhood so much but it felt like that it's like mm-hmm. you know what uh i because i wasn't gonna have him talking to me like that th- th- much longer you know whether i'm 20 or not you know <laughs> it was like okay you know and by the end of that run at wembley man i was uh, it was you I know up. yes I was determined that uh, you were not going to talk to me like that anymore. And I just, I turned a corner where I realized that, you know, if I really want this job, you know, I, I, I need to focus harder. I need to work harder. You know? Damn. I wonder, was it, if, if it was Prince's dad or some, he has that black, that older black man, uh-huh. Tighten it up, boy. You know, y- y'all gonna tighten it up. Y'all not gonna have me out here. Look, 
He just has that. I sound like he he had that kind of in him. That's like, his dad. Yeah, Fritz yeah, told me okay. his dad would tell him. <laughs> yeah, I can, yeah, I can hear it. His dad would say, you're going to play the piano, you're going to bang on it. Yeah. Okay. It's that. It's yeah. that same thing. My grandparents, my granddad's <laughs> like that. I've known, I've seen men like that, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, what are you, like, what are you doing, son? Are you going to play this thing? Are you, what, what, what is it? Are we wasting our time here? You know, you going to play that piano or you just go bang on it? Yeah. There was a little of that. And that's, and that's what I needed. It pushed me, and I didn't like him very much for it, but he ain't I got where I was life. trying yeah. to go. Mm -hmm. uh, he changed my life with that, yeah. you know? That's, that's what, And that's what they say. I ain't here to be like. <laughs> right, exactly. You know? And I was like, okay, I got it. I know what it takes now. I don't have to work for this dude. Right. But, You're you going to carry that I, with you. I, was, you headed, I was headed out, mm -hmm. you know? It's Bobby Z. Bobby, Bobby stopped me, man. <laughs> God bless you, Bobby Rifkin. <laughs> yeah. All right. We got now. We got uh, yeah. We, we got <laughs> Two hours later. <laughs> All right, man. I didn't mean to, to talk no, so no. long. I, I appreciate you, brother. Yeah, we're going on four hours now, so we can we can cut it. Woo. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for sitting still long enough to listen to me. To, oh man, you know. ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, leave your comments there and say hello to Michael Bland. And like I always say, work it like a job. We'll see you next time. Peace. Peace.